It's now time, everyone. So we will now open this symposium here at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Thank you all for your participation in this event. My name is Iwai. I will serve as today's moderator. I'm the executive director of Keizai Do Yukai. Now, to open the symposium, I invite from Keizai Do Yukai Representative Director Mr. Takeshi Ninami. Mr. Ninami, the floor is yours. He's over there. Please, over there. Hello, everybody. I'm so sorry, my voice is so weird. We got the hay fever. Should be gone sooner or later because Okinawa doesn't have hay. So, which is good. And uh, I wonder, um, I'm back. And I love Okinawa. I love nature. I love ocean. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know which language is better, but uh, because of Karen and uh, her team, I'll switch to English. So again, Iwai-san, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Tak Ninami, um, uh, chairman of uh, Keizai Do Yukai and uh, uh, CEO of Santori Holdings. Um, I'd like to express my thankfulness to Karen we met uh, more than three months ago, right, in Tokyo. And we agreed that uh, we would have this symposium with the uh, Keizai Do Yukai and the Okinawa Keizai Do Yukai. At that time, uh, I hadn't told the Sibesan Kawakami-san to hold this uh, symposium. But uh, thanks to two leaders of uh, Okinawa uh, Keizai Do Yukai who agreed to be here today. Thank you so much. And again, of course, uh, Karen and her team. We had a great discussion. And uh, I'm very much hopeful that uh, August will have the, another journey after Peter. But we have a great leader from Sweden. So I'm sure August will be, again, uh, thriving, resolving lots of issues with the uh, central government uh, I have to support, as a matter of fact. So I have to stay with the, uh, this draft as a matter of fact. So, well, I'm sure everybody here is uh, thrilled to engage with the OIST. As you know pretty much about its success, it's uh, one of uh, the uh, best known and the really successful institutions in R&D in the world. It's amazing. And uh, how we can leverage it, and plus how we can grow this um, journey, I mean, success, um, successful journey for the sake of Okinawa, Japan, and the world. Um, I had the great honor to be here last time to celebrate the 10th anniversary. And uh, I spoke about a uh, lot of uh, potential as well as a lot of successes of the uh, R&D of OIST. And uh, every time I'm so excited to meet up with the uh, people here, very talented researchers with the uh, very diverse faculty. And uh, that means a lot to the uh, our education in this country, Japan. I think uh, we are learning a lot. And I uh, hope uh, the learning will be realized. So. And uh, I think uh, the journey between the uh, academia of OIST and the business like us, Okinawa Do Yukai and the Keizai Do Yukai in Tokyo, will be, I would say, never ending journey. We have to keep working together and uh, we'll find more opportunities to engage with each other. So this is the day we will uh, restart the, this journey under the uh, current leadership. Now, for the continued development of OIST and Japan, Okinawa, 
we must ensure not only the growth of our economy, but also the acquisition of strategic indispensability from a geopolitical perspective. We can't avoid it. Um, I think uh, we'll be surrounded by more geopolitical and geoeconomical issues. But we have to work together to, to support R&D led by OIST so that eventually the basic R&D will bring a safe world, stability of the order in this region as well as uh, the world. And uh, I'd like to stress the importance of quantum AI, robotics, bio, healthcare, energy. Energy is so important. And uh, we have to be more focused on uh, those areas. We can't get things uh, scattered. For these areas, strengthening basic R&D is indispensable. For generating new innovation, Japan, working together OIST, and Okinawa must invest more in science and innovation. And to train up the next generation of world-class problem solvers and the scientific talent, both homegrown and from all over the world. Again, we have to keep more diverse. And Tashiro-san always talks to me. Where's Tashiro-san? Oh, right there. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anyway, so we got to unleash our potential, which means we have to learn from OIST in terms of the value, virtue of diversity. And from this beautiful Okinawa Islands. And of course, OIST is playing a critical role in this initiative. Diversity of faculty and students, and OIST focus on the results have already contributed to its historical success, I mentioned earlier. Companies like us have a crucial role as well in creating innovation. Today, I hope we'll be able to have the uh, lively discussions between academia and uh, companies. And we'll have the uh, shared vision, shared hopes toward the uh, much brighter future. I'm going to talk about the current Japanese economy. I think we are now hitting a tipping point from a 30 year, 30 years long deflation to the uh, moderate inflation. The other members here from business pledged to increase at least 5% of wage increases. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I hope. If uh, you haven't pledged, please do it so that uh, we can make use of the money to basic R&D. By the way, um, per capita R&D expense shows the uh, growth of the uh, GDP toward the future. And uh, we got to increase basic R&D. That is the future of the country, of the region, of the world. So OIST will be in that center to make use of the, the investment from corporates and the government. I said uh, corporates first. And uh, with Santori, for example, have been working with the OIST in many areas. And uh, we have a strong hope that those results of the uh, joint work with OIST will create very ambitious future of both OIST and Suntory. So that means we corporates have to play a critical role too. So today, the first day for some of the companies to have the uh, engagement with the OIST, but uh, I'm sure you'll have the big surprise during the discussions. And uh, please, please come visit after this one and uh, have a serious talk with OIST and uh, support OIST working together. So 
to conclude, key thing is how this kind of activities with the support of Okinawa economy as well. Don't forget that uh, Okinawa is such a great island prefecture. And working with the OIST, working with the Okinawa Kizai Doyukai, working with the Okinawa business leaders, definitely Okinawa is center. And uh, we will work together between Tokyo Kizai Doyukai and uh, Okinawa Kizai Doyukai to boost the economy of uh, Okinawa. And uh, I hope uh, OIST will be a part of it to pick up Okinawa's economy for the, for the sake of uh, Okinawa people's, um, I think, uh, uh, quality of life. It's not, I'm not talking about only economy. The purpose of life, purpose of uh, corporate. I think definitely Okinawa is so important. And personally speaking, I love Okinawa. That's why I'm saying that. So today, uh, let's work together. And uh, through this symposium, we all gain a deeper understanding of OIST and have a lively discussion on how we can drive innovation through industry academia collaboration and uh, promotion of Okinawa. Don't forget about that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ninami-san. Now I'd like to call upon Dr. Karim Marokides, president of OIST, to give us a talk. And that will be followed by Associate Professor Keiko Kono and Professor Kae Nemoto to present their research projects. Uh, Professor Marokides, uh, please start. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and uh, especially thanks that we uh, uh, for this kind uh, start of this uh, symposium and with uh, a lot of ambitions that we have together, and for both uh, corporate organizations to bring them together here at OIST. This is fantastic, and we, will, we are going to respond and do the best we can to make this to be very successful going forward. Let me tell you a little bit maybe about myself. My name is Karin Marquides, and this is, uh, I don't know where the, the world map ended up. <laughs> it's supposed to be a world map over there. But uh, um, but you can see maybe the, if you if you recognize the Swedish uh, uh, this is uh, Stockholm University there is where I started uh, and I just want to tell you a little bit my journey quickly here to see so you can see a little bit who I am okay so imagine there is a world map over there and and it points at Sweden okay so uh, so here uh, it's natural science and resilience. No, no, it's supposed to be first. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, natural science and resilience is something that I learned there very much and sustainability. And then I uh, actually moved on into um, Utah and Brigham Young University. And there I learned long-term mission and uh, how to really work with startups and transdisciplinarity. And uh, then after that, I moved uh, over to um, uh, Uppsala University, as you can see there, and there uh, I became professor in uh, and worked a lot with industry collaboration in Sweden and global networking. And so after that, I actually uh, worked uh, some time at uh, Stanford University, and there I learned a lot about system thinking and design thinking. And so um, I started to add on to a lot of interest for universities, the role of universities. And uh, I ended up in becoming a, a, pr a president over Chalmers University of Technology, where I ha had an opportunity to test a lot of these uh, things that I learned in test beds, open centers, and transformation in, with, together with society. 
And after that, I um, took a, a job together with uh, California and Armenia. And uh, uh, there I worked a lot in a post-Sovietic type of co collaboration in a country where they needed to develop global local role and outreach. And, uh, and after that, uh, I actually became uh, chairman of uh, the Danish Technical University in Denmark, where they merged uh, in research, uh, a research university with seven uh, research institutes, and now have become the strongest technical university in Europe because of that. And, and of course, after that, only OIST could top all that, of course. And I'm so happy to be here to really work with um, Curiosity Drive, exploration in the intersection between knowledge, between also different players in society, and uh, to make universities a role model. Uh, also here, I, here you can see the map. Uh, so, so here I just wanted to shortly say that what type of things I have done before uh, outside of the particular university setting. So first uh, to educate change makers in different kinds of um, um, of uh, laboratories, and uh, and then uh, with, uh, with different networks of universities in Europe, and I was a leader of CESAR in network of, of technical universities in Europe, and uh, around the Black Sea also in another network. Uh, I also worked at uh, the Swedish Agency of uh, Innovation and different research institutes and innovation centers in Sweden. Uh, I also, now you start to see how old I am. Don't count this up, please. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I also uh, worked a lot with setting up new types of science centers, and uh, four of them actually in the Gothenburg area. And uh, that uh, uh, was a very, very interesting journey, actually. And I'm also a member of several academies, and uh, one of them are selecting the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which also is a fun thing to do. Uh, and, uh, and also, I have been actually working on the boards of two, a big company, chemical company, Perstorp, and uh, a small startup, uh, agile company in uh, Einride, that is uh, actually a startup in, a, in autonomous goods, goods transportation. So, so then you you can see that. Um, oh, also yes, sustainability. Oh, this is a, a very good connection to Todai. I worked very much with uh, together with uh, Komiyama in at uh, Todai when he was leader there, and we worked very much in the Alliance for Global Sustainability with uh, industries all over the world. And MIT and uh, and uh, yeah Imperial College and ETH and so, universities like that, and also of course other type of networks for sustainable development. So um, so I would like to then from there go on and tell a little bit about how this connects then to uh, Japan and how I see this in in Japan. So first first of course. Uh, we, you can uh, you can see how t I believe really that we can unlock some of the um, potential of Japan as a global leader in innovation by really uh, look at the signs that are coming. Now, now I come from Europe and I can see that in Europe everybody talks about Japan. Everybody talks about now it's time to really connect to Japan. We have to have a really strong alliance with Asia and Japan. Is the, natural choice so we have to so now when i'm here and i'm in the university they really encourage me to work more and to really connect more so um so i get a lot of support and i think we shouldn't be afraid of that support i think we actually should invite that connection uh, because we need to consider the global uh, solutions and also i what i what i hear also hear in sweden from uh, the, the corresponding organization like you are in Sweden, uh, they talk about that basic research is really what they need to connect to from the corporate side. So we need to find new possibilities, close uh, connections with uh, between basic research and corporate. And we can, I will show you a little later how, how we can work with that. And so th then the challenge is that um, 
and that of course are in the air like digitalization and, uh, um, yeah, and of course to really make sure that we are see uh, the PhD as an agile resource lead for leadership and uh, system thinking. We need to, uh, to really utilize the system thinking and circular thinking to really uh, get into competitive solutions where, where we actually have also sustainable and resilient solutions. And uh, trust-based collaborations. Of course, trust is a really important word. And, and you know that trust comes before money. So uh, we just have to remember that. Uh, and of course, here is uh, very something that you have seen million of times, I guess, but really to see that uh, research in, in can be, of course, connected both to the basic, uh, to, to the applied, but also to the combined use-inspired use basic research. And up there in the Pasteur quadrant, that's uh, very much uh, where we can find the new breakthrough to new so uh, solutions. And so there is, uh, of course, also where the, the nations can win the most if they treat their universities to be free and to be able to work with the corporate, then the nation will be the winner. So we all know that. And they, that was actually published, uh, remember, 200 years ago. So we, we uh, should really take on that, I think, at this point. So here uh, I just show a little bit also that universities are more and more a natural uh, connection to most parts of society and uh, really not isolated with their basic research. It's uh, more and more we are finding ways how we could work and, um, as a natural host for public-private university partnership with uh, uh, new knowledge, uh, integrated knowledge, disruptive knowledge, trust-based knowledge, and uh, transformative leadership. Remember that we are not only providing knowledge, new knowledge, and combined, we are also providing the next leaders. So um, universities have a lot of untapped potential, of course, uh, and uh, exploring intersection of disciplines. This is something that we are uh, seeing now what we can do more of here, where we have really strong researchers that are actually really broad and they can go curiosity-wise in any direction. Still, there are intersections between their knowledge and others' knowledge. And there, we, if we can put incentives and we can collaborate with corporate in those intersections, there we, we can, where we can find really uh, the next uh, competitive edge. And transformative collaboration is, uh, of course, something that we have to base it on trust and we have to base it on continuous uh, dialogue in, uh, um, in between both the strategic level and the operational level. And diversity uh, release, uh, releases creativity, we all know that, uh, but we have to do it with inclusion and we have to really make sure that this, uh, that this really is uh, coming out in a positive uh, exercises. So, yes, yeah, so now to OIST. OIST has a mission that is actually uh, quite uh, fantastic. It's, it, co it covers really um, more or less what, where we are today in the first sentence here, where we are, have research and education and curiosity drive and uh, very, uh, very strong. So we need to keep that, of course, and that is a challenge by itself because if we start to look in different directions, we have to make sure that we don't lose the edge that we have and the uniqueness. Entrepreneurial environment and outreach is something that we do have a really good start on strength. But here, of course, we have lots to do to connect better to the real local public sector and individuals. And also we have to connect the startups with the basic researchers. So we are working on that. I'm sorry, I was just going to say also that sustainable solutions in the last sentence here uh, to really con connect the global and the local uh, attractions that we can uh, be a destination for um, uh, people to come in the areas that will be are strong and when uh, also uh, really work very much in reality labs together with the uh, actors here on the island. And uh, we can make that visible also to make even more attraction and solutions to come about here in Okinawa. Yeah, so, um, so 
so yes, we are actually, um, and this slide is to show a little bit that we are, we are uh, very proud of the strength that has been built up here. We have a very high competition, both on when students come here, so 55 enrolled from 825 applicants. Also, we have high competition if you want to become a professor here at OIST. We had, uh, I think, 1,452 applicants for five positions. So it's really, you really need to be really good to be able to come in here, and of course, we try then to see how we can support and give incentives to the ones that are here. We have a Nobel Prize coming from my home university in Uppsala in Sweden. I'm very proud of that. And, uh, and of course, we have a good uh, scientist uh, and good performance of, this, of the scientists in, uh, in uh, the world. Yeah, that is, of course, something that you all have heard of in the Nature Index. It's, uh, uh, it's not only that, uh, that OIST has made a, a fantastic fast move and it coming up in, in, among the, the best in the world, uh, of course, considering the size uh, in that normalized data. But, uh, but still, I mean, it's, it's really fantastic. But the trend is also fantastic that we're trending high, good in, in publication and activities in this way. So, so this, uh, this is something that we really need to keep and continue. And so here is a reminder, and so what are we, we are actually 12 years old or young. And that means that we are getting into, as I say, the teenage years. So of course that means that we are going to find how, are, how is always gonna be mature? What is it when we become mature? And so, so that we have to, there are certain things we have to consider. And um, it's, I'm not saying that we don't have it, but we have to really make sure that we have a different strategy on the global attraction and national networks and local change maker. I mean, these kind of um, um, words that guides us to how we should um, how we should move forward, and we can we can really uh, build on this in and making different kinds of meeting places for for our um, uh, development. So here I just showed three different types of meeting places that are that we are um, exploring and developing here, and that I also have some experience from before, as you saw. So uh, mature universities have many different laboratories. You, we can have uh, virtual open centers, which means that um, these are uh, exploration, exploring intersections, the visibility and attraction in the world, overlap uh, perspectives between different open environments, and they are self-organized according to the professors that work in them and drive them forward. And they are also very good for uh, um, attraction, for donations and uh, support. So um, we also have in the middle here testing um, uh, test beds and reality labs. And then we are very, very happy that we are now signed uh, uh, with Okidan and to that we should start to build this, uh, the test bed on sustainable energy here. And uh, this, um, I hope that most of you, uh, of course, because sustainable energy can attract uh, most all companies in different ways. So I hope that most of you will be take part in this going forward. And the public-private university partnership could be more of a, a modern type of science uh, um, center that we could, or science uh, um, laboratory that where we could meet between different uh, actors around strengths that we can see in the different municipalities. On that note, I talked to the mayors now to see what they would like to be uh, strengthened in their region, and we could help each other to build on that uh, when it fits our research that we have. Okay, so, so just to show you, uh, uh, just so you can see that virtual open centers, we are, we are talking about how we are going to move forward and really in line with uh, what the researchers here are interested in and want to do. But uh, just to look at uh, the ocean around us here, you can see that up from the, the quantum on the upper corner down to uh, the environmental down here in the bottom and, and all in between, we have so many different type of research that connects um, uh, with different types of overlaps in the marine area. And of course, um, we, we, we can see also that uh, in, in the quantum and in, in marine science and sustainable energy systems and environmental questions, all these uh, could actually be uh, gain on, uh, you know, have the focus and also have overlaps 
that uh, can be uh, work in the intersection in between. And, and here, just to see what a uh, testbed for sustainable energy can include a lot of different things, all the way from capturing energy and, and uh, uh, storage energy and, and also the uh, removal of energy, smart grids, and um, uh, be more effective in biocombustion and, and understand the weather forecast. Yeah, there's a lot of smart grid. There's a lot of things that could be included there. And uh, uh, just then you might wonder, do we have the researchers? Yes, we do have quite a lot of research. You cannot uh, have time to read all this here, but, but you can see that we have research in most of these areas already, although they are not really working together, but to, with incentives and uh, nice, interesting projects, this could really be, they really could, uh, if they have interest, be connected to this. And one of the uh, areas that I po point out here uh, to capture carbon dioxide from the, the seaweed farms is something that was quite interesting, that uh, this is a very unique uh, um, research supported by NOAA, unique that they never support something out of the United States, what they told me at Scripps University, who is uh, running this here outside of, uh, in, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, ONA, I think this is in ONA actually, in the harbor, yeah. So, uh, so l really looking at uh, the, uh, a lot of the, the chemistry and the, and the, the streams of what, all the different kinds of conditions that you have around these seaweed farms that you can see here. And, uh, and really understand how this, um, how this connects to also stability for, the, uh, for the, uh, the farms, but also for the corals and the fish, and also how we can... Um, uh, how really this uh, uh, environment can capture carbon dioxide. Uh, uh, and why do United States, uh, actually NOAA, support this research here? Because they told me that uh, Okinawa is the world experts on seaweed farming. And so, uh, so they said that that's why they go outside, and because this is going to be a very important business in uh, the whole world. Uh, so... Uh, yes, so I told you earlier about that uh, we are working with a, a corporate in, a, in a, a maybe a different way. That uh, This I have actually worked uh, on in Swedish companies and it really works very well. So I hope that we can, we can really uh, build and develop this way of working. So it, it, it's really, you can see here that it really connects with a handshake between the strategic uh, leaders, so the CEO level, and then it is multi-coupled, and it's also, of course, based on the very the research with the PI, good research in the university and in the industry, and then research projects coming about here, putting in in uh, here, as you can see, in a um, uh, in a uh, uh, table that we follow the different uh, the different projects on a six-month basis and uh, really um, uh, see how we can suggest. And the, the, the role of the leaders here is to really say to the researchers that we need to, you need to do things that you cannot do yourself and uh, that uh, you, can, you can really build, um, uh, take risk and take uh, new possibilities together. So, so this, uh, and also uh, to visualize uh, and develop this um, collaboration uh, according to a portfolio or projects. This is, uh, um, and, and also you could put in some projects in here that are setting new standards and working in new ways. So I think uh, this is actually a way that I hope that we could work more together. And we already have one a example of this, I could say. <laughs> so I think that we are more or less in the collaboration that we have with Santori that we are actually following this uh, way of working. So I'm so, um, very happy to, uh, to see that we now, uh, also with a new collaboration we, we set up uh, the other day with um, Okidan, that we can continue to develop it in a similar way. So, um, so I would, would like to also, there are many things happening at uh, OIST, and we are very much looking forward now to see as that a mature university has 
uh, has a lot of collaboration. Collaboration is something that in both internal and external, and as, as I said before, on all geographic levels. But we need to meet when we have collaborations. And so now we are actually, we do have uh, quite a lot of possibilities. And uh, for instance, in, uh, in projects like the... Um, this one here, the CUI Next, uh, that we have a real collaboration with between the research and the industry in projects. And, and we do have also now the new um, uh, JPEGs that we can mature the university to support really the, uh, all the activities that we're doing uh, internally and get skill sets to come up and, and uh, also uh, help and support our infrastructure. And, uh, and of course, talking about infrastructure, we have one incubator now. In a year from now, we will have number two and number three. And we have uh, also sea nexus and land nexus buildings for uh, unique type of meeting places. And of course, we are also the seaside house here will be developed uh, for the, in the future. And we already are planning this for, um, to be the destination for visitors, visiting scientists from the whole world. And so, um, so this is uh, happening right now, and I hope that next time you come and uh, hear that you will see more of this in action. So thank you very much uh, for this, and I'm also looking very much forward to the discussion, active and um, ambitious discussion that we will have here today. Thank you. But President Markides, thank you very much. Now I'd like to ask Professor Kono to give us a presentation. I am Kono from OIST. Thank you for this opportunity. Very nice to meet you. So um, I am Associate Professor of the uh, um, Membrane uh, Research Unit. I am the um, senior researcher there. And um, this year is the seventh year for me. I came here in December 2017, and uh, my research group consists of 10 researchers coming from around seven countries, so it's uh, quite diverse. So those uh, researchers have different uh, background. And then uh, we are uh, doing research on aging or senescence, and uh, the latest result uh, has been published in Nature Aging. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, top journals in the area of senescence. And then uh, on the cover of this month's edition, uh, we have our research being introduced, which I would like to talk about today. So our bodies are made up of approximately 37 trillion cells. And then um, those cells have different shapes, different functions. And then all of these cells are surrounded by cell membrane. And then the green ones are um, cell membrane, and the red one is the uh, chromosome or DNA carrying genetic information. And the green is cell membrane. And then um, the cell environment that is uh, changing, um, from such changing environment, the cell membrane is protecting what's inside the cells. So cell membranes are very important, but cell membranes are very, very thin. And then um, this is the normal cell, human cells, uh, looking at that with EM, and that is being cultured. And then this is uh, really magnified, so the actual size of the cell is like this, and it's really very much uh, um, magnified. And then um, this um, black line, which is uh, five nanometers, which is like drawn by a pencil, this is the cell membrane, and this is uh, really, really thin. It's um, only one. 20th of the soap bubble. So um, this uh, membrane is uh, often damaged and repaired, and that is being repeated um, every day, every hour, every minute, every second. Uh, several membranes are being damaged and repaired. And then we breathe, and then on the surface of the lung, 
nanoscale, really small holes are being made, and then they are repair, repaired in a space of only several seconds. You may do some exercise or work out, like swimming or running, and then there is much、um, burden on your muscles. And then on the surface of the mu muscles,、uh, there is a nanoscale, small holes are being made, and then、um, they are repaired within, a, within some seconds. And that way, we can maintain the.、Um, Our state of the body. But then, if there is no repair, and then if this repair mechanism uh, is uh, somewhat uh, damaged, muscle, muscular dystrophy uh, can occur. Eventually, you lose the、uh, muscle tone completely. So, the repair system or mechanism of cell membranes is very, very important for our bodies and for our health. So, the damage on the cell membranes and the repair of the cell membranes,、uh, this research area has a history of over 50 years. And then those、uh, cell membranes, when they are、mm, damaged, what happens to the cell inside? There are two fates. One is、uh, wound heal, and then、uh, the cell、uh, gets repaired and recover, and then、uh, starts to division again. So the holes that are being made,、uh, they are repaired. And then the other fate is the wound cannot be healed, and then cell kind of explode. That's the cell death. And then, however,、um, the third fate of the cell,、uh, senescence, that is something that we identified for the first time in the world. So what is cell? In essence,、uh, you may have heard of this already, but let me just、uh, review this once again. So,、um, these are the cells, human cells, normal cells that are being cultured、uh, in the lab, not cancerous cells. On the left is the normal cells, on the right hand side, right -hand side is aged cells. And then, cancer cells are divide forever, but the normal cells、um, they divide 50 or 60 times, and then、uh, the proliferation or the expansion、uh, gets arrested、uh, forever. They don't die, but then they don't divide. Any longer, so they don't expand any longer. So that is、uh, what happens to aged cells or senescent cells. And then this is just one normal young cell. And then we have fibroblasts that are under the skin. And then you see this thin shape. And then、uh, it has uh, some uh, the thickness and it's kind of uh, uh, the fuzzy. But then this huge cell is really, really big. This is a senescent cell and it's very much flat. It doesn't have any. Height and then proteins and enzymes that are being released are different. And then、uh, we use the reagent to stain the senescent cell in blue. So, this is the senescent cell. So, those senescent cells、uh, they are there in our bodies. And、uh, just a little bit of a good thing is done by senescent cells, but a lot of bad things are being done at the same time. So they are not expanding any longer. But how come they do what is good or what is bad? What is called SASP, that is a protein that is soluble in water, and then that is being produced outside of the cell. And it's not a hormone, but it's kind of like a hormone. You can take it that way because it's easier to understand. And then、uh, it's soluble. In water, and it produced in a, a big amount, and then in the bloodstream, it goes to different sites of the body to improve the immune function, or to accelerate the repair of the damage, or as a bad function, it may cause cancer, or it may also cause senescence across the body. So, senescent cells have bad functions as well as good functions, and those senescent cells, they are drawing. A lot of attention across the world among researchers because those senescent cells,、um, this is actually caused aging in our bodies. This is one of the reasons. And these are the rats, but it's the same in our body. So, those、uh, um, in our aged bodies, there is an accumulation of、uh, senescent cells. And this is what is called senolytics. Senolytics is a kind of a drug. There are many different、uh, types. And senolytics, when it's administered,、uh, Our body can get rejuvenated. You may think this is like science fiction world, but actually,、um, researchers across the world are working.
working on this theme in earnest. Let me show you one example. And it's not my research, but then as you can see, at the glance, um, this is a um, uh, research uh, result from the United States. This is an aged rat, so you see um, the uh, loss of hair and then uh, the um, graying of the hair. But then if you use uh, the uh, senolytics uh, kind of a treatment that's done, then you see a lot of hair is growing. So no more uh, loss of hair and no more gray hair any longer. So um, hair is not an area of my research, but then a um, variety of organs inside the body uh, can actually recover their functions with the uh, suicide of the uh, senescent cells. So this is what's been reported. So going back to my own research, so our cell membranes, when they are damaged, uh, um, cell senescence uh, occurs. So why is it it's important? Because the senescent cells, how are they being produced within our body? We never had an answer to that question in the past. So in the lab, DNA um, change, like uh, if you smoke or if you drink alcohol, your DNA can be damaged. And uh, when DNA is damaged, the cells can be aged or um, cell senescence may be caused. So that's something that is happening in our body, we thought, because that's the observation we had in the lab. But then even without the damage of DNA, senescent cells can accumulate within our body. Why? So why is it that those senescent cells appear in our body? So it was a kind of a question we had. And then cell membrane, when there is a damage on the cell membrane, cell senescence may be caused. And then what about the uh, genetic uh, uh, gene expression patterns in the senescent cells? So we actually identified those uh, genetic uh, uh, mutations that are occurring uh, in those cells in the lab. And that is exactly what is uh, happening within our body, meaning that senescent cell is being produced because of the damage being done on the cell membrane. So if the cell membrane damage is stopped, we can probably stop the cell senescence altogether within our body. So that's our research result. So um, this is an illustration um, that was uh, created by an illustrator to express our research. And the motif here is a kintsugi, that is a traditional uh, culture of Japan, a broken uh, uh, pottery uh, is being repaired uh, with the lacquer mixed with gold. That is a traditional Japanese culture of uh, uh, repairing the uh, pottery. As an analogy to our research, so cell membrane being damaged and the damage can be repaired. But then uh, the uh, pottery does not go back to the previous state, but then uh, the uh, nature is completely changed um, in an irreversible manner, but then um, in a completely different uh, shape. And uh, cats age, uh, dogs age, and humans, we also age. Uh, so um, everything um, that has life can age. That's uh, what you may think. But actually, uh, there are certain organisms and animals that do not age. There are many of them, like uh, jellyfish and some kind of the... Um, uh, some kind of a sea animals. And this one is a naked mole rat. You may be familiar with that, this. Some kind of sharks uh, may not uh, age either. And this is uh, from Africa, naked mole rat. This is a uh, living underground. And usually rats die within two to three years. But then naked mole rat, uh, they can live for 30 years, 10 times. And then uh, until just before they die, they have childbearing function. And then they keep their bodily function until until right before they die, and they don't develop cancer. So from them, we can probably learn something and suppress aging in our body, in humans. So senolytics um, has come to the clinical phase two stage already, many of them. It's not been commercialized yet, but then within five years or seven years, I'm sure that uh, uh, some of them will get commercialized. So um, uh, the strategy is not to kill the uh, senescent cells but to uh, prevent the uh, damage on the cell membrane. And thanks to Ninami-san, thanks to Sun Tree, we are now trying to develop uh, uh, such supplement. And uh, with that aim, we are pursuing basic research. And we have to rush. We have to accelerate the research. So I'd like to continue to have your support. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Assistant Professor Kona. We hope that this will become practically applied any day soon. I think we're all hoping for that. So next, if Professor Nemota, you would like to give your presentation, please. Yes, welcome everyone to OIST. This is the second topic that we're covering, and that is to do with quantum science information. So a very different area now that I'm presenting onto what you just heard. I am from the Quantum Information Science and Technology Unit. I'm the leader, and I'm the head of the OIST Center for Quantum Technologies. Hello, everyone. So I think you've often heard about this. This is from the Cabinet Office. This came out a number of years ago, the vision of quantum future society. So quantum technology will have an impact in our high information and advanced society. It will become much more fused so that we have a much more efficient platform for our technologies going forward. Often quantum computing is what's talked about, and it's a lot of focus on speedy computing and calculations, but across the whole of ICT areas for computing, sensing, data gathering, as well as security, communications. It is a very broad ICT-wide technology that quantum will begin to be fused into and merge into. Why all of a sudden are we hearing about quantum? I'm sure many of you will find that surprising or you ask that question. Well, our technology platform is more precise, more efficient. We are heading toward that and we are evolving toward that. And as part of that, electronic have become quantum. We are shifting in those ways. It's a very natural progression of technologies. And this world of quantum, by being able to manipulate it, we can have even more precise, even more efficient technologies which can be brought about from that. So it's not just for IT technologies. This is for transportation, bio, energy. This macro range of technologies is something that we also believe that quantum technology will have a great impact on going forward. So how do we support that? Well, there is a national engagement in terms of these quantum innovation hubs. There are 11 hubs right now around the country. OIST is one of those. OIST is here as an international quantum link site to support this. We have the Center for Quantum Technologies, which was established in OIST from 2022. So the kind of things that we are engaging in right now, as I mentioned earlier, there is a real wide variety of topics. It is across all areas of technology that quantum will have an impact. We begin from the principles of those technologies, and that's how we create an impact on algorithms, computer hardware, IOQT, which is IOT, but the things becomes quantum things. And you have connection between those quantum things to create the IOQT, to create new functions, as well is looking at how do we merge with encryption technologies. So looking at these topics, looking in the future, we're trying to identify those areas that will be important and key critical areas going forward, particularly for OIST. We have some excellent researchers gathering around these particular areas, but we are still a very small scale university here. So these critical areas, these key areas is what we're focusing in on rather than being too broad. So. This is my own personal research unit in terms of the areas that we're researching and where we're looking ahead to the future for our research. So these are the areas that we research right now. The lines show the connections between those different areas. It does become rather busy with all these lines, but looking in this way, it's computers that might chime in with quantum machine learning or device. They're often treated as different things, but within the research area, there's still so much connectivity as is shown here. And also looking at peripheral areas of research, particular focus areas are things like neurosciences as well as bio applications or edge computing and big data science. These are those sorts of things that we think will apply. From here, I wanted to pick out just three things that I wanted to cover in more detail. The first is with regard to new functionalities. Well, what would be new functionalities? Our technologies are extremely precise. They are already able to do that right now. However, when you look in the world of nature, in the natural world, there are even more amazing phenomena out there. For example, photosynthesis. 
taking light, harvesting and capturing light and using that harvested and captured light when it's used, it's almost 100% efficiency that the light is used. That kind of transportation phenomena is something that we, with our silicon hardware, we really don't reach those levels. So we're looking particularly those as clues and suggestions for us to try and find ways of leveraging quantum to find loose control models using environmental systems. Often environments are our enemy, but in this case, we're using an environmental-based systems to do controls. For example, using quantum self-control. This might become possible in the future is something we're thinking about. Another area I wanted to mention, when we talk about quantum, quantum is about connections to be able to exert greater power. One thing I wanted to mention and suggest to you as, a, as an example is here, what's often said is, this is the kind of question that's often asked. So right now, our information society that we live in, computers are so important, and there's a bad influences of that too, but Sorry, there's a variety of different uses. But if, for example, we didn't have computers, it would be terrible, wouldn't it, if we didn't have internet? It would be very inconvenient. So quantum computing, even if there were quantum computers, if there's no quantum internet, how would we connect the quantum computers? Would that be by the postal network? That would be very inconvenient. So we want to be able to find ways to connect that information, quantum information, to be able to maximize the power that the technology has. Looking at our current development, this is where we're at right now. Accelerator, whether that's the right word or not, we're looking at this merged, partially merged area where you have some quantum power, but we're also helping out what the cloud is doing, or we have quantum sensing. Things that could not be measured up to now is being measured or can be measured in a more efficient way. So, for example, in the UK, there is the Mission 3 National Quantum Strategy, so this is health system, medical systems, which are part of that mission to leverage the data that is being collected for being able to have healthier, longer lives through early diagnosis and treatment, for example. And as interfaces become established, then we see true connection between quantum and it starts to really exert and express its power and ultimately this would be quantum ICT technology, the age of its maturation. You would have a quantum internet and you would have quantum computers which merge into the classical environment. So there is still a great deal of research, basic research that is ongoing for this in terms of interfaces, quantum sensing, how to combine those together and how we create that merged technology going forward. That's very much what we research. And finally, I wanted to mention quantum computing and algorithm development. There's two things to this. First of all, fault-tolerant computers, large-scale computers. What do we need to do to get there? The other thing is looking at the existing computers, looking at processes that right now, what can we do with those? We're doing that too. So looking at the ultra conductivity. We have a quantum computer. Back in 2016, IBM came up with a quantum bit machine and it became available, released over the internet to be used. And from there, there's been progress. So now we're about here. So back in 2022, IBM had 433 qubit Osprey machine that it released. And of course, Google, China, and various other organizations and institutions have made releases of 50 qubits or a few hundreds of qubit, not just ultraconductive, but also ion trap and other methods, or Poughkeepsie gates, to come up with a variety of quantum gates. However, to get to a quantum computer, there is still a lot to do before we get to a true quantum computer in terms of the problems that we haven't fixed yet, like connecting quantum, which I mentioned earlier, but also looking at the basic research that needs to happen in this area. And also, we think that architecture is highly critical in this field. And looking at the architecture, you have the architecture, and then finally, you can have a large-scale computer that can be developed. Hence, as quickly as possible, we have to create the technical layers and we need to thoroughly analyze these so that we have an architecture that each technical layer, layer can be put together to be able to meet a feasible quantum computer. We have to do that theoretically and scientifically, and that's what we've been working on. The other thing that we've been working on is how do we use what we have right now? This is also a big challenge that we're facing right now. 50, the 50 qubits until a few years ago, 
When Google released this back in 2019, up until then, 50 qubits was just a dream. We were barely getting to double figures. So 50 was a huge thing back then in 2019. What is amazing with 50 qubits is that it's possible to be able to calculate, but although that's amazing, what you can do, we still don't know what it can fully do with the current processing. But when we think again about what's amazing about this level is that Virtually having a 50 qubit processor, the network that that creates, it creates a network almost as big as a human brain's number of neurons. Of course, it's virtual, which means that you cannot freely manipulate all of those, but it has that potential. How much of that potential can we extract? That research is what is ongoing right now. And this is one new example that I wanted to show you. Up to now, things that hadn't been going so well, how can we make those work better? This is a specific example I wanted to cite. So quantum computers are solving simple problems here. As time passes, quantum computers are able to produce answers and solutions. In this way, individually, quantum is being introduced and we have classical, simple classical systems by merging those two things together for the first time. We have this example, a usable, practically effective example. This is just 11 quantum bits to give a solution level of 97%. So the fashion MNIST is more difficult. A human can only get a correct rate of 83.5%, but it's about 90% or just there or there. So, so you are able to achieve a level of solution correctness that is similar to deep learning. So, this is the power of quantum, I think, that we can see from this example. And when you look at quantum computing, how it's been positioned, back in 2018, the quantum computer was said to be around here. So, we kind of overcome the hype, and we it was thought that it would be about five to ten years before it became mainstream. But after that, five years passes, and here we are. In other words, that... Although we'd said five years ago it would take five to ten years, now, 2023, we're saying it's going to take ten years or more. So the view on quantum computing has changed because the elements, the unknown elements are still a lot. The application research, the basic research, there are many areas where those are working hand in hand. And this is where quantum learning, machine learning is also an impactful area. There is still a lot of, it's still said to be the dawn of this age because in the five years, what's moved on is the hardware technology technology. In other words, when you look at quantum machine learning, if you have an idea, then we have this big technology readiness level, TRL level jump, and then you go from here to here, and then the scale of the time that changed here, the progress that's made here, really shifts. And quantum computers, if you watch those here, the key things, it's necessary to make sure that we really cover these thoroughly. So our research is very much focused upon this. So hardware and software, this non-obvious connection between the two, this is where we have this new potential by doing a lot of that. In the future, we should be able to grow the mainstream. And finally, uh, you should just have in front of you this document. Uh, I've just distributed that to all of you. So this is the SIP education program. We also are looking at this program that's been offered. And this is in collaboration between industry and academia. So these two, the course and program, this year's course is about an introductory course to quantum technology. This will be a Toyoki. Yaesu exit, and this will be held at the Tokyo Academic Commons. The press release is expected to be released at the end of this month, though this is just a step ahead that you're getting this information ahead of everyone else. So on April 18th, there will be a presentation at the Yaesu exit of Tokyo on April 18th next month. So we're targeting generalists, people within companies and businesses who want to be able to understand the basics of quantum technology to help them see the future. It's a program for developing those kind of resources. We also have a research technology program. This is spending six months at OIST in a research program. This, again, we will be seeking participants from April, and we're going to be starting the program in June. So I truly hope that you can keep your eyes peeled for more information about this. That's it for me. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. This was also a technology full of possibilities and dreams. So now we'd like to have all three uh, together uh, to take up some questions and comments. If you can please raise your hand, I will appoint a speaker. Um, and please state your name and affiliation and also indicate who your question is for before um, stating your questions. Yes, please, the person with the hand up. Suzuki-san, please wait for the microphone. Thank you very much for that. I have a question to President Marquides. At OIST, what are the areas or domains that will be researched, or what kind of researchers would you like to recruit further? And how systematically are you determining these factors? That's my question. Thank you for this question. Uh, yes, uh, we are, uh, of course, we have a broad uh, um, knowledge base over the our small university. So at this time, we were uh, recruiting five new professors, as I said before, and we had an open search. That's why we got so many and so broad of course, a pool of uh, applicants. Uh, but we did that actually uh, really to make sure that we would, we would get also uh, quite a diverse group of applicants and uh, not the least females. And so we're very happy to see that in the, in the shortlisted ones now on 22, we actually have 50% females. So, so that was by itself a success, but, in, but at the same time, we were not looking at uh, other things than just quality of the applicants. So of course, as we grow and become more mature, and we can also show more of the, the research fields like, uh, like Kayana Moton just showed, and of course, we, if we show this to the world, we will attract um, more uh, researchers that would like to be here in these environments. So more and more, that we will uh, by by really showing what we are doing, we can attract researchers that would like to come and add and feel secure that they will have an environment that would uh, be uh, interesting and make them also be to uh, contribute even more. So so I think this is a balance between uh, how when we are building our critical mass and that we want a diversity and also that we, we really want to, to hire on the highest quality so, uh, and, and the size of the university. So all these things balanced, we have to adjust to this when we are um, recruiting. So the areas that we are really seeing coming up, of course, neuroscience was very early on. And uh, that is still very strong, and it connects more and more to other parts of knowledge, in, uh, and uh, both in the digital side, of course, and the quantum side, but also to genomics and other um, the functions in uh, and uh, in the body and how that develops and are influenced. And uh, so that uh, genomics is a very strong area, and as I said before, this energy is uh, kind of connecting and, and uh, coming along very strong and might be the really um, move very fast, I would assume. Uh, of course, uh, we have the marine side, the marine biology is one area, the, uh, of course, also the rest of the chemistry and the whole um, ba balance in the ocean with uh, connecting to both energy and the corals and uh, and farming, farming on land also, biodiversity are both in the in sea and on land, are very strong areas. Uh, and uh, that uh, all these areas that I mentioned are of course very important for uh, wh where we are in society today and going to be influencing the, the next uh, competitive edge of many areas. So. Um, so they are examples also of uh, disruptive knowledge that will really connect to many different application areas. Uh, for instance, the biodiversity and the blue zone of uh, Okinawa, of course, is something that we, uh, we could really influence uh, personalized medicine and uh, the food um, 
area of the, the both uh, everything from from food to pharma, if you want, and of course in the medicine area, uh, medical area also to understand also the the importance of your our surroundings, uh, how we are going to develop um, and and be healthy in our life. So, yes, we are a small university, but. Yeah, as I said, we we have an enormous breadth, and what we're trying to do now is to uh, to really, in addition to that, we try to balance how we recruit. We also try to really make sure that we are um, an, a, a destination for visitors. So we try to develop even more the the visiting uh, ability of, and of course, Okinawa is a nice place to come. Mm. To, we should be able to attract, and with the uh, combined with the island and also the research, then we can get a dynamic uh, inflow of of people that would come here from the whole world and contribute, and uh, and that uh, should really be very important for the innovation area here. And also for uh, for the island as such as to be a test bed for for solutions. So, yeah, I hope that was an answer. Thank you, Karen. Thank, thank you, Karen. You well, well, actually, that uh, in addition to that, that uh, my question is that uh, whether you have the strong kind of the organization to judge or to decide which areas mm -hmm. you are aiming for or it's up to the to the ones that are applying to we want to get the best uh, of, of the pool of applicants that come want to come here so what we can do is to show ourselves in a way that we would attract um, and and that uh, that's the only way we can uh, influence we we don't really want to choose uh, who uh, areas we want to choose the best scientists that they should come here. Thank you very much. Um, then Yamaguchi san, please. I hope you can hear me. Yes, hello, this is Yamaguchi speaking. Thank you so much. So my question was for Assistant Professor Kodo. You were talking about cell membrane research. That was the question that I had. Um, so looking at cell membranes and the harm or the damage to them, you were trying to do research to prevent such harm or damage to the cell membrane. On the other hand, partway through, you're talking about damaged cells which die off, and you were talking about this muscular disease and illness that can result from cell death. So when the cell membrane dies, are you doing any research to regenerate that kind of cell membrane or is that being done somewhere else? The reason that I asked the question is that muscular dystrophy that you mentioned, we actually have people, employees in our company with muscular dystrophy and every day it does progress and when you see that, I want to see that being resolved as quickly as possible. So that was the reason for my question. And also a similar question, preventing that kind of damage of course and regenerating any cells that have died is, of course, great. But in terms of working with medical institutions, how are you doing that? Particularly, do you have something to accelerate your research, working together with industry, for example, leveraging quantum computing? Or is there anything like that that would be really useful to you? Please tell me if there is any such topic. And finally, I also have one more question. I'm sure everybody wants to know about this, but with Centauri, this joint research, that supplement, when is that going to be released to the world? I really want to know about that. I'd be interested in the roadmap for that development. If you don't mind, it would be great if you could answer those questions. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. This is Kona speaking. Thank you very much for the question. My apologies for that. This is Kona speaking. Thank you for the question. So with regard to muscular dystrophy and people who suffer from that, right now it's very difficult to cure muscular dystrophy is the quick answer. Um, in terms of methodology, to make it harder to damage or harm cell membranes, there is this um, extra cell mem uh, collagen and other protections, ways to protect the cell membrane is one method. The other way is to look at repairing the cell membrane 
brain, there is a protein called Escort. So this actually quickly repairs harm on damage to cell membranes. So by having that, it's possible to, certainly within laboratory environments, to increase the speed of recovery. So looking at muscular dystrophy patients, it's possible to slow down the progress of symptoms possibly going forward in the future. And then in terms of a true cure method or treatment method, so muscular dystrophy is actually a DNA or genetic inherited um, inherited condition that people have. So recently with crispr kidney, for example, it's possible to do gene changing or editing to be able to fundamentally um, correct or cure that situation. But there's still basic research that's going on, I think, in terms of our journey. There's still a long way ahead that we're facing. On your second question, would you mind just saying that for me again? Yes, so it's the same as the third question, I guess, but in terms of your collaboration with medical institutions or in terms of working with industry, in terms of making progress in your research, is there something that you're looking for? Maybe you want to be able to freely use quantum computers. I'm sure there's a variety of dependencies that you might face, and if you have such, if you could tell me about those. Thank you for clarifying. So Suntory for the uh, supplement, the sesame and other supplement development, um, they have a lot of experience on that. So we are joined by Suntory researchers. One uh, researcher actually from uh, April this year, they're going to be sending somebody into here to be based here in OIST. So really it's that basic research first to have that really trustworthy, trustable mechanism for research. And then beyond that, we can move into the development of the supplement itself. So it's about from now to 10 years ahead, we're working together on that kind of basis, that kind of timeline. And then finally, you were talking about when the supplement is going to be released. Least, well, I'm working really hard on it. <laughs> so maybe, hopefully, in 10 years' time it'll be around? Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Okay, Ishimura-san, if you have a question. Yes, thank you very much. So this is a question for Professor Nemoto. If I may, uh, let me see which page you were on. I think it was on page three. You were talking about the quantum innovation hubs. You had a diagram on that. So in Japan, there's clearly a lot of these quantum innovation hubs. But from a researcher's perspective, because I'm at AIST, so I'm at top left, that's where I would be located on this diagram. But there are so many of these quantum innovation hubs and the development of quantum computers. Really, do we think it's going to be very efficient? Is this an efficient way of doing it, having it spread so much? That was my question. Yes, so the quantum innovation hubs, are they all involved in quantum computing? No, that's not the case. So each of these hubs... So, for example, if we talk about Tokyo University, uh, Tokyo University here is looking at the way quantum computers can be worked, used in certain ways, but it's not limited to that. They're involved in a variety of different ways to using that. One of the representative ways would be just selected as the name of the particular hub. So it's just one representative name that's being used here. So in terms of the quantum international collaboration that's been described here, it's not the case that OIST is doing doing just that. We are also here on the quantum frontier to look at quantum computing, security, a variety of other things that we're engaged in, not just international collaboration. But when there's a lot here, if you look very closely, there's actually only five universities involved in these hubs. And also there are other national institutes which are here. The national institutes are more mission-based institutes. For example, if it's AIST, for example, it might be about making supply chains more robust or strong. That would be their initiative. So large-scale quantum computing, there's a whole variety of elements that go into that, but to be able to create something really large is what we're trying to do. So. In line with that, we have a system to support that, and we need that. So when you think about the latest advanced quantum computing research, all 11 hubs are not doing that. That would be the way I would answer the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I'd like to take just one last question. Master san please. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question to the Malkides. And well, uh, the question is related with Suzuki-san. So do you pay to the professor more than the average of the university professor in Japan? So because the I know that we do see the competition uh, well, with other university around the world. And then obviously the salary of, of Japanese professor is well, lower than other or foreign professors in other countries. So do you have any, how do you call that, the strategy for those kind of pay? Thank you very much for this question. I, I'm sure that uh, many believe that it's uh, only salary that matters. <laughs> but, uh, but in fact, it's also something that attracts very much to, to OIST is uh, uh, the, the high trust funding uh, mechanism. And what does that mean? It means that we are attracting uh, researchers that really are driven by curiosity. And uh, in most, um, um, I, I don't think that the systems in the world have really thought through this, that they would, uh, you know, s uh, make researchers to limit their curiosity. But in fact, that is what happens when you have, uh, you know, funding agencies that are outside of the universities and uh, and uh, you all the time you want to focus, you want to be able to measure the results, you want to... Over the years it has been more and more controlling the researchers, uh, you know, the, you, you put them in boxes and you, you, as a researcher, you stay there uh, to get money. So, so, you know, there are so many researchers that have their uh, curiosity and that they should do. We should have more of that. And here we are act actually finding a, a way to do this by hiring the, re uh, the researchers and let them really get uh, resources that they can build up their own group, they can get their own their equipment. Some The big equipment, we, we uh, more or less, we open it up for everybody. But it's, it's, you can say it's free for some time. And then we really evaluate international every five years. So we evaluate after, and, but they don't have to really, for the basic funding, they don't have to write proposals. Of course, when they get up in speed, they can write proposals, they can add that, uh, a lot of other resources on top of what they do have in the basic. But I think that is really, uh, uh, what is attracting most here, and in you know, to be honest, all all universities should work like that, really. But it's almost impossible when they're big ones. But we we should be careful and and keep this, and by having it here at OIST and collaborating with other universities in Japan, we can actually ben everybody can benefit from that we have this here. Thank you very much. I'm sure that uh, there are a lot of other questions you may want to ask, but then uh, we have gone uh, past the time, so I'd like to conclude this part of uh, the session. So, President Markides, uh, Associate Professor Kono, Professor Nemoto, thank you very much. Please give them a big round of applause, if you will. So now, uh, we are going to go into the panel discussion. And the panelists, uh, please uh, come to the front. Uh, we will get ready, and it will take around five minutes for us to get ready. And we'll get started with the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, so I think we are ready. So let's uh, start the panel discussion. So from here, uh, the moderator is Mr. Toshikazu Nambu from um, Douyukai, and he is the chairperson of Committee on Studying Advanced Science and Technology Strategy. So please take the floor, Mr. Nambu. Uh, so, uh, I am a co-chair of Committee on Studying Advanced Science and Technology Strategy. I am Nambu. I have come here to Okinawa for the first time in 30 years. And uh, Kitazawa-san, who is also the co-chair, uh, was one of the founding members of uh, OIST, and he was very much looking forward to it. And then we have uh, really um, uh, wonderful three panelists. 
to have the panel discussion. Thank you for your taking part. So uh, we have two, um, broadly speaking, two themes uh, during this uh, panel discussion. One is uh, innovation through industry academia collaboration, and the other one is uh, Okinawa promotion, um, as pointed out by Ninami san. So first, I would like to ask uh, three panelists to have brief opening comments. First, uh, uh, from the left, uh, from your side, uh, from the right, Motonaga-san. Uh, he is the um, from Okinawa uh, Electric uh, Power Company. So please uh, introduce yourself uh, briefly. He is president and the representative director of Okinawa Electric Power. Uh, so Okinawa um, Keizai Douyukai, I am also the, um, the uh, vice um, chairperson of Okinawa Douyukai. Many of you are from Tokyo, so I'd like to talk about uh, some characteristics uh, of the power industry or business in Okinawa. So as you know, Okinawa, um, we do not have uh, interconnected uh, network grid with the main island of uh, Japan, and uh, we are very small, and we have a lot of remote islands. And then uh, in terms of the natural uh, environment, uh, the sunlight uh, hours, it's quite short. It's on the national average, and then we have um, typhoons coming every year, and then uh, high temperature, high moist um, humidity, and then we have a lot of the uh, um, the uh, salinity, a salt problem. And then uh, in terms of the electricity, we have a complete liberalization. Like in the uh, main island, we have 20 or so businesses who are supplying power. But then we have a lot of the remote islands. Therefore, in terms of the power distribution transmission, we have a kind of the dominant presence. So uh, there are certain similarities and differences um, to the mainland. And towards the carbon neutrality, uh, we have to overcome a variety of challenges. We have to take on those challenges, and that is the environment we work in. And from this perspective, I'd like to give you my presentation later on. And we will be hearing your presentation later on. So next, um, Mr. Gil Gramnot Meyer, um, Vice um, President of OIST in charge of innovation. And from Tel Aviv University, um, you have um, an MBA, you have studied law, and also you have been in the law area, but also uh, you have experience at the Weizmann um, Institute. And you were the CEO of the company that was take that was um, supporting the Weizmann um, Institute. So, therefore, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, the kind introduction. Um, so, uh, from my perspective, I, I see great potential here in, in Okinawa, and uh, very uh, strong similarities to what happened in Israel. So I see a uh, young population, I see uh, uh, great potential in human capital that can grow in, and, uh, and the, the need to be thinking global. Uh, so uh, with that, and uh, what attracted me to come here to Okinawa uh, was OIST, and OIST as a, a growing power in the academia and uh, a leading uh, university in the world. And I see this as a great potential to really create a change here in Okinawa. And we, we're going to talk about it later, but uh, uh, I'm very optimistic. Thank you very much for that. Well, I also visited Israel several times, and it's a very unique country. It's a very unique region, and later on I hope that we can hear about that as well. And thirdly is uh, we have uh, Na Mr. Nawaki Mashta from WeQ. Uh, so uh, he's the CEO. So visual communication, in the area of visual communication, in order to resolve social issues, I believe that's the main thing that you are taking up. So one word. Please. Yes, thank you very much. I was hoping everybody would be in Kariyushi. Uh, oh, yes, there are people wearing Kariyushi. I think this is the formal wear for Okinawa, but um, thank you very much. Um, as was introduced, I'm from a company called WeQ. I'm, I'm the CEO. It's a startup, and also I'm the founder of the company. It's a startup. However, it was started up 
um, at a university 25 years ago. Back then, uh, it wasn't called a startup, it was called a venture. It's a university launched venture. I'm from Keio University. Keio University also invested in the company, and um, this company has grown. And in 2012 in Singapore, uh, we moved there. So one third is um, Singapore, one third Japan, one third um, United States. And we are taking up all kinds of different businesses. And therefore, I'm hoping that I can um, make comments from that perspective. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So 25 years ago, a startup back then, um, but there were many companies that were made, bought, and so I think you have this mindset as a startup company and also as a company manager. So now, let's take up the first theme, which is uh, the industry academia collaboration. I believe we will have two presentations, first from Gil-san and then after that from um, Motonaga-san. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Gil-san, please. So, uh, I just want to share with you some of our uh, uh, perspectives and how do we try to uh, progress uh, the collaboration. And uh, here you can see that, uh, very similar to President Merkida's uh, uh, view of uh, connecting the university with different stakeholders, we actually uh, look to collaborate with the local, with the uh, national and the international community uh, to build uh, additional ways to collaborate with uh, industry. And this is really to create several things. Uh, first and foremost, product and services to support humanity. And coming from academia, I've seen a lot of products that many of you do not realize that were really created from basic research. So basic research, as Ninawi-san mentioned, is fundamental for our existence and for to, to tackle b the big challenges that we, we face. So I'm going to give you some examples uh, of, uh, of these sprouts of, of products and services coming out of uh, um, OIST. Uh, and we do that with, uh, with several tools. Uh, first and foremost, of, as, as you see, uh, the great research that you've heard about, but also we, we want to leverage that and to help transform basic science into technologies, we have to have these tools. And these tools include startups, and we're going to talk about the importance of startups as a tool to bridge between basic research and the, the market. Uh, some of them grow to be big, big companies, some of them can be acquired by your companies. And I think Japan should do more in that direction of uh, leveraging startups. Uh, we need to provide funding for this uh, early stage, and we need to attract talent. So um, I'll jump now to some case studies, very short case studies, and you should bear in mind that we are very young, but still I'm amazed that OIST has managed to do uh, so much in such a, a, a quick, uh, a short time. And uh, these uh, examples show the potential. Uh, so if we go now to the first two examples, uh, these are graduates of our acceleration program. Both of them are people that uh, either graduated from OIST or worked at OIST. And they enjoyed our support, and with our support, it wouldn't have, without our support, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, so you can see Hair Life Lab tackling women health issues and uh, menopause, uh, and just launched a, a service here, web service here in Okinawa called uh, Vival. And uh, this is a very important issue for all your, uh, half of the population, and many of us really don't know about it, and, and many of us do not know how to tackle that. Uh, uh, Reps Japan is really producing some protein, and these uh, protein pills are being sold now uh, on the island uh, in uh, um, Family Mart. So you see, we already have some uh, products out that uh, impact us. Uh, Another graduate from our Startup Acceleration Program, and here we, uh, these are people that we bring outside, so we open for innovation globally, and we, as, as President Marquita said, we recruit scientists globally, but we also recruit talent and innovation globally. So EF Polymer came from India, and they had no, no knowledge about business, very uh, limited capabilities in language, in English, and also had no ability to operate in Japan. And with our help, here in Okinawa, they set a base. They employ many people now. They uh, support 12,000 farmers. 
what they produce is a polymer produced from uh, agricultural waste. This is really uh, transforming circular economy, taking waste, transforming it to something useful, and helping uh, reduce irrigation. Not just saving water, but also reducing work labor. And we, we face a uh, growing aging population of farmers. Uh, they supported, and how we do it from Okin the world to Okinawa and from Okinawa to the world. This company has now donated uh, five tons of that with the help of local companies to Ukraine of the product. So the product is really supporting Ukraine uh, um, uh, people. Uh, we have two new startups in uh, analytics of, of uh, chemicals and uh, biomarkers. They just started off. Uh, the Metabol is working directly with Suntory. Uh, ACI Research got uh, funding and is operating. Uh, moving to uh, the future the project, so uh, one of them is the Chura Otome. This is a, a, a rice that was developed here, a strain of rice, by Professor Saze. And uh, this uh, is actually uh, starch uh, resistant, uh, which means that uh, this product can really help people with prediabetic condition. And uh, we are actively seeking now partners uh, to grow this and to develop products. Uh, this could go into beverages, so we had a, a pilot uh, beer created with that, uh, but uh, it could go into other uh, products and uh, really support uh, health. And that comes from Okinawa back to the world. Uh, we caught some nice attention about our ability uh, to cultivate uh, squid. And we're going to have a startup uh, very soon that will do that and develop the technology from the lab to the market. Um, going to the funding, so just uh, um, I'm very happy to say that we've created, uh, uh, together with Lifetime Venture, a fund. Uh, in 2022, and this is a 5 billion uh, yen fund uh, aiming to mainly invest in deep tech. Uh, one of the general partners reside here on, uh, on campus, and this is a unique example of very close ties between them and us. Uh, they've done almost half of their investment in uh, companies related to OIST, either founders for OIST, research for OIST, or uh, programs that graduated from our uh, activities. They deployed already 800 million yen, uh, and they uh, uh, got very interesting uh, investors, including Suntry Holding, uh, development, Okinawa Development Finance Corporation, and the Development Bank of Japan. By the way, all of the three of them have special relationship with OIST and special collaborations with OIST. And you can see the synergy of how, how can university work with industry in multiple levels and create an impact. Um, and last but not least, uh, we are open to communication and please visit our website and see our activities. And uh, I want to highlight uh, that next month we're going to have here with OIST Lifetime Venture, uh, an event that is really matching uh, startup uh, entrepreneurs and investors, and all of you are welcome to uh, look at this event. And uh, many other activities, we have multiple channels of communication, uh, and I'll be happy to take any further questions later on. Thank you so much. Thank you, you, Thank you so much, Gail. So uh, actually, with regard to industry to academia to collaboration, we had some great questions, but you talked a lot about employment, risk capital, you talked about the impact on communities. So thank you very much for the comments that you provided. So um, we were going to do some Q&A here, but before we do that, let's go to Motonaga Sound's presentation, because I think there's going to be a lot that resonates between the two. So let's begin with that, and then let's pick up on common questions between the two presentations. I hope that's okay for everyone. Thank you so much. Motonaga-san, if you'd like to continue. You did briefly touch upon some of this, but if you could. Yes, thank you very much, if I may. Just briefly, I would like to explain my presentation. On the screen, as is shown, just three days ago, we signed on March 21st between Okinawa Electric Power and OIST. We, aiming toward a decarbonized and sustainable society, we signed a Memorandum of Understanding. For Okinawa Electric Power, with this collaboration, we're working towards decarbonization and carbon neutrality. We want to accelerate our engagement on this. And also, we want to look at the specific and unique challenges that we have in our region. 
And later on, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the meaning behind the MOU. And also, earlier I briefly touched upon the situation that our company faces, as well as our engagement in carbon neutrality. I'll go through those in some more detail. So, first of all, what's shown on this page is the area that we supply power to in the Okinawa area. It's a vast area that we supply. So, east to west, it's about 1,000 kilometers. North to south, it's about 400 kilometers. And there's about 160 islands scattered over that vast area, of which 38 islands are inhabited. So, to those 38 inhabited islands, we provide power to all of those locations. As I mentioned at the beginning, we do not have any interconnectivity with other power companies. Hence, to these islands, the, each of these islands has its own power generation facility. There are 11 powers, power stations, and from there, we supply with undersea cables power to the whole area. And we charge the same rates for electricity anywhere in this region. Looking at our composition of power supply, as you've already heard, in Okinawa we don't have any nuclear power, we don't have any hydropower. What that means is that we are very much reliant upon fossil fuels in our composition of power supply. So about 60% is about coal, oil, coal, sorry, oil is about 13%, 21% LNG. LNG. So renewables are about 7% right now. Those are the most recent numbers. So our 2030 goals is we want to take coal to 50% or lower. We also want oil to be around 10%. What we want to increase here is LNG, which has lower CO2 emissions, taking that up to about 30 percent, and we also want to introduce, further introduce renewables to take that to 10 percent or higher of our composition. So looking now at Okinawa's CO2 emissions transition as well as our power generation history. So the CO2 emissions peaked out in Okinawa in 2008. Up until then, we had been focused on coal-based thermal power generation. And with that, we had very cheap prices for electricity. But in 2012-2013, over in Yoshinoura, we introduced an LNG power plant. Since then, our CO2 emissions has vastly reduced. And in 2022, Compared to that peak level, we were approximately 20% lower in terms of our CO2 emissions. Further, in 2030, we're working towards, as I mentioned a moment ago, we want to increase our LNG makeup. So, compared to 2005, our start point, we are looking at a 30% reduction in our CO2 emissions. So, what is Okinawa Electric Power doing toward our 2050 CO2 net zero emissions? This is our roadmap. We're looking at expanding renewable energies. We also want to reduce CO2 emissions from our thermal power plants. These are our two main pillars of activity. Additionally, though, we're the producer of electricity, but we're also looking at the demand. The users of electricity, it's important that we have that kind of demand. We work, therefore, with local municipalities, universities, as well as OIST, as I mentioned earlier. We want to deepen those ties and promote electrification to ensure that there is good demand for our product. On this page, we are talking about how we want to make renewable energy as our main power source. There's a number of examples that I've cited here on this slide. Surprisingly, Okinawa, in terms of renewable energy, there's a lot of challenges that we face. So solar power, there's only limited land area, so it's hard to have a mega solar facility. So we're leveraging rooftops. We're using our customers' rooftops. We're borrowing those to be able to expand our solar activities. For wind power, as I mentioned earlier, we we get typhoons every year here in Okinawa. So on the main island of Okinawa, we're not in a position to be able to create a large-scale wind power facility. And at the bottom, we're talking about our remote islands in terms of the kind of renewable efforts that we're doing. So Kurimajima and also Hateruma Island, these are two islands that I've cited here as examples. For both, we have been able to have 100% power supply with renewable technology. We're doing some testing right now to verify and validate that. 
that. Particularly on Hateruma Island, we have a tilting type wind power. On remote islands, to be able to avoid the impact of typhoons, we're taking these tiltable wind turbines, which can be folded down in the case of typhoon. We're also using uh, diesel hybrid type energy. So that in, for 10 days, it was possible to be able to meet Hateruma Island's energy demand with just these methods alone. So looking outside overseas and outside the region of Okinawa in terms of what businesses that we do, we are, have a lot of remote islands. We're introducing renewable energy. So we're trying to leverage that knowledge, that knowledge that we've accumulated for more than 30 years now. We're trying to leverage that in other areas of the world, island nations where they face the same challenges that we do. So the photograph on the bottom, this was back in December. It is in Dubai, there was the COP28. So there, we had a, the ministry invited us to explain what we do um, in our region. So I gave a presentation. On the other hand, if we look at reducing CO2 emissions from thermal power plants, as I mentioned earlier, first and foremost, we want to shift to increase the use of LNG. The next thing to do is looking at hydrogen, ammonia, those kind of fuels which are CO2 free. We have to introduce those types of fuels, but there are big challenges associated with that. There are technical verification validation needed. There's also supply chains that need to be established. Because we're facing those challenges that go ahead into the future, but immediate for the immediate future, we've looked at the Yoshinura multi-gas turbine power plant, and we're doing some testing of co-firing with hydrogen fuel. We're looking at around 30% of being able to co-fire, which around the country is still a very high level that we are achieving. So with all of that, what we have done this time is between OIST and Okinawa Electric Power, having this memorandum of understanding is taking us toward carbon neutrality. We want to leverage this OIST world-class level of wisdom as well as its research capabilities. By combining that with our knowledge and know-how, we want to combine those to make it to something really much, much better. And we were also interested in startups with the same kind of technology. Technology. We want to be able to support them too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Motonaga-san. So it kind of almost takes us to our conclusions, so very specific, and it really tells us about the challenges that you face and how we overcome those hurdles and you want to work together to do that. So thank you very much. Let's try and deep dive on some of that. Let me begin, first of all, as moderator, I wanted to ask about OIST. I want to understand better about the presence of OIST. What does OIST mean? So I'd like to ask the question of Gil, if you don't mind. So. As as uh, President Markidis mentioned earlier, in 12 years, you've already produced a Nobel Prize winner in the field of healthcare. And also, if you look at the papers which are published by OIST, you exceed all the other Japanese universities. You are actually at ninth in the world of all the universities. So in 12 years, that's amazing outcomes that you've produced. So from the OIST perspective, what is the big factors that has enabled that? How is it that you've been able to create those results and situation? Or perhaps as President Markidis mentioned, I mean, I don't know who's right to answer this. Well, certainly it's a question for the president, but I, I can do my best. Uh, um, I think uh, OIST uh, has a secret source that uh, not many universities has, and this is uh, the high trust funding which President Makedish touched upon, which allows uh, great minds to be free and to do what, what they really are passionate about. So this is curiosity-driven research. Uh, and the question that we had in the uh, previous uh, session was, uh, how do you direct, what fields do you choose? and uh, this is really the model that the Weizmann Institute and other universities uh, actually do. They select the best people. And if you source globally, it's a better pool. So you get really very good people. And you give them the freedom, and you choose them also young and promising. Uh, and you combine also more mature and, and young. But uh, the young, talented people, if they get the freedom to do whatever they uh, are passionate about and pursue big questions and challenging questions, it is very much uh, a success uh, by itself. Now you have to have the ability to translate that also to the real world. And OIST from the very beginning had OIST innovation 
as part of its activities. So, uh, and we're very grateful for the founding fathers that really thought about it from the beginning. So we created uh, a tech transfer office, uh, but we're also having now incubation, as President Marquitas mentioned, growing incubation space, uh, starting to work with, the, with startups, uh, and looking into how can we impact also Okinawa. Uh, so um, I think these are the key factors. Uh, and we have to really realize that this is a strategic asset for Japan, for Okinawa and Japan, and how we can really transform it into be as resilient as possible and as a, a role model for other universities. Thank you very much. It's a very clear-cut answer. Thank you very much. So uh, universities in Japan, or the number of PhDs not growing in Japan, and it's because of the uh, job stability uh, issue or uh, not being able to pursue the research they want to pursue or a silo type of uh, uh, organization problems. There are many problems. So any suggestions to alleviate those problems or any opportunities for collaboration? Well, uh, I think uh, I'm not familiar enough with the problem in Japan. I, I was struck to, to learn that uh, uh, having a PhD is not a, a, a clear advantage because where I come from, uh, it is an advantage wherever you go uh, in business, in industry, or in academia. So um, my, well, I come from the collaboration with industry, so I immediately I would say the solution would be to let the industry work closely with the academia in a way which does not change academia and does not change industry, but learn how, what's the benefit of having such uh, huge uh, uh, knowledge. And uh, President McKinnis also mentioned that it's not just uh, excellent research, but also leadership. So we need to maybe also to adjust our planning. What do we teach our students in a way that they are also uh, growing to be leaders in 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 uh, in, uh, in the industry or whatever they, wherever they go in government in, in academia or industry. So I hope I answered your question. But, uh, Thank you very much. Yes, there are many different uh, tips and hints that we can learn from you. Uh, as a two panelists, if you have any comments on this topic, um, it's your time. Yes. Um, companies and the universities, uh, how can they get connected? I think that is a very important question. Looking at the world of research and development, 3.5% um, is what they count within GDP. So we are number three in Japan, and the United States, uh, the 3%, uh, uh, and uh, Singapore, 1.8%. And so we spend quite a lot of money for R&D, but then 73% comes from the private sector. And the United States, 63%, Singapore, 60%, meaning that uh, quite a lot of money comes from the private sector for R&D. So this R&D, so to what extent uh, that is being pursued in universities? From the university perspective, the uh, research money uh, proportion from the private uh, uh, side is 3.1 percent. In the United States, 5.4 percent, which is more, uh, close to double, meaning that uh, um, the company money is not really coming to the university so much. And then uh, PhD is not very much appreciated. That can be a problem. And also companies and universities Universities, they are not coming together. I think that is also another challenge. When I talk about these challenges, uh, even if you go to university, um, there's nothing to be invested. So it's like uh, um, uh, egg first or the chicken first problem. Because there aren't attractive projects, uh, we don't invest. And that's what companies say. But then if there are um, good projects attractive to companies, then companies spend money for that. That will accelerate research further. And that can attract the talents more from around the world. So this is going to be a virtuous cycle. And we'll be talking about startups later on. So connecting with the companies, but not just companies, but also including startups, I think this will create a very interesting environment going forward. Yeah, thank you very much. That's very important. So um, the, we need to change uh, the relationship with the private sector. That's something we have to do. And then R&D, um, R part and D part. And then um, Otoro-san said that 
but uh, um, these are the challenges. We have to work together. We are starting to do that. But then which technologies are most effective? Uh, we have to scan the horizon and then uh, uh, find a good research uh, to have social implementation later on. So are we focusing on our part of that? Or uh, research, basic research is there already. What about uh, how to apply that? That D part, development part, is also important. And we have to strike a good balance between our part and the D part. Any comments on that? Yes, uh, research institutions and companies, uh, I don't think there is a needs matching between the two. So that is a challenge that needs to be addressed. So all the research results, uh, they are stellar in the world. Everyone recognizes uh, the great outcome of research in OIST. And as uh, Okinawa, uh, economic community, how can we tap into those uh, research results and commercialize them uh, to make business? And this has to lead to the promotion of Okinawa. So that's what we have to do. And for that purpose, um, companies as well as the OIST, uh, uh, the companies need to incorporate seeds that are available in OIST to commercialize and um, have application of these seeds in the real world. That has to be done on the company side. And for that purpose, we need to have close collaboration between the two parties and have great discussions and then uh, lead those seeds to the business. Yeah, for that purpose, uh, we have to really identify the needs or the challenges. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, um, just to add to that, I think uh, uh, we have to realize that there's a big gap between what universities produce and what the industry really wants to take immediately. And uh, if you realize that there is the gap, you also build the bridges to support this gap. Uh, so it has to go from the university side, but also from the industry side. Uh, so the university side, very much more openness, much more business uh, understanding, and tools to develop our technologies. And that is, and, and that is really important. Not many universities do that. And uh, to the extent OIS can serve as a model, we, I think it could be a model. And then looking at the industry side, first uh, understanding that industry not, does not come to buy re results. They come to generate knowledge with the university partnership, equal partnership, and that is going to grow into something. And also realize that there is a big risk in that doing so. so but if you don't do that, you cannot be competitive on a global scale. So uh, from industry side, I think this is really crucial for industries to do. Uh, and they need to also do the, some steps to so participate in incubation, participate in acceleration, collaborate with the universities, send people to the universities to work closely with them. Uh, it is uh, putting resources, uh, not just money, but also uh, attention is very important. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Gilson. So I think uh, um, both are on the same ground, I guess. And if that is the case, OIST research, so for instance, uh, basic research, uh, what is the end of the um, uh, universe? What about creating a drug uh, for immortality? I think Ninami-san wants to say that. So it takes uh, 10 years or 10, 20 years, but this is very important uh, for um, the researchers and uh, um, low-hanging fruit to be harvested. That is what the industry wants, and there is a gap in between the too. What, how can we um, address this uh, gap? So there is an idea, there is the reality. Motomura-san, you have the uh, certain specific challenge, but uh, what do you think? How can we narrow this gap? Well, it depends on how far you are looking into things. Um, for example, deep tech. Um, you might think that this takes long term, um, especially around deep tech. Um, the country and venture capitals, uh, there are fundings over a longer term, um, five years, ten years. I, I believe there is a possibility of doing that, and we do see some examples of that happening. And KO's uh, campus, Fiber, is another example. It's something that you can't think about achieving something over the shorter term. Companies couldn't come in, but with deep tech startups, uh, this is now happening right now.
From the industry side, yes, uh, you do need to see some low-hanging fruits. If everything is far from reach, it may be difficult. So I think you need to have a good combination of the two. Well, yes, it seems that for major companies, they seem to have a shorter-term perspective. Um, sometimes the leaders might say, how long do you think you're taking? But you have to have dreams, but also you need to have some um, real uh, fruits that you can get along the way. So you want to support that. Yes, I think there's a combination, um, not just going to the United States, but also trying to put in money here in Japan as well. Well, thank you very much for that. Don't just go out to the United States. Come, um, invest some here in Japan as well. So maybe as Okinawa as an axis, if we can have an ecosystem, um, that may become a good example, a good model. So for Zoyukai, um, how funding should be or how CVC should be, how do we um, collaborate um, in terms of technology? Uh, that's something that we need to look at. So one last thing for this session. Uh, before I started this, I didn't know about OIST at all. I thought that, well, OIST is a fun, fancy name, and as I made my research, I found out that it was a very unique university. It's very difficult to benchmark. It has a 12-year history, and we just heard that uh, presentation. But can you, well, Ninami-san found OIST very early on, but maybe promoting OIST or pre presenting OIST so that the industry can really understand. Uh, maybe I, I'm the... Um, I'm different from others, but uh, but how in order to build relationships? Gilsan. Well, I think the fact that all of you made uh, uh, this uh, afternoon available for us and came to visit us is, is a very reassuring uh, uh, start. And we would like to have more business leaders like you understanding the importance of voice and, and appreciating, appreciating that. We also need your advice, so sometimes we are not clear where we should go, and, uh, and you need, we need your support with the government. I think uh, OIST is, needs to find uh, additional sources of funding. We are working hard to do that, uh, competing uh, globally, competing locally for funding, but also uh, looking for philanthropic funding. And beyond that, industry uh, academia collaboration. And in the future, we're, I'm, I'm positive we'll have also income from commercialization. Having said all that, uh, I think from a national stand of point of view, we are uh, gener generously supported by the Okinawan uh, promotion budget, but we need additional sources. So I, we seek you as, as our supporters mm -hmm. to find uh, the next way. And if I may, the, another way to really support us and to um, understand where we are is to come and have presence here. So the new incubator is, uh, is, is a start. We plan to invite companies to join near that and maybe create an R&D center, joint R&D center. Uh, it could be a combination of several companies. So uh, this is the longer term vision. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so for the Douyukai, uh, I think that's a um, homework for my committee, for CBC, R&D, how uh, can we really promote um, um, OIST and Okinawa. So that's something that we will take back as our homework. And also Suntory. Well, if Suntory can come up with a supplement uh, so that we don't age, I believe that would be the best way to go, maybe to promote OIST as well. <laughs> for the promotion of OIST. And yes, Suntory, uh, you can make the investment. <laughs> so it's not just Suntory making money, but we all can make money. Well, uh, let's talk about money later. Now, so there were several other questions for this session, but um, Mr. Suzuki um, actually covered some of the points So uh, through his question, so I'd like to move on. Can we move on to the next part of this discussion? Yes, um, and so that was about industry academia collaboration. Next, I'd like to focus on contribution to Okinawa promotion. And this part also, I'd like to ask um, Gilsan to make a short presentation, uh, which will be followed by this Q&A discussion. Well, Lambasan, I actually touched it on my presentation, okay. so yeah. 
I showed uh, our activities in startups, and uh, uh, I can I can answer the, any question in that respect. But uh, no presentation. Well, excuse me. Yes, the presentation covered everything, um, and based on that, we'd like to move on to the Q and A. So then, um, if I may start. So Okinawa, it's a wonderful place, and I saw this presentation, and I thought that this was a gateway to Asia and other places. But why is it that OIST is placed in Okinawa? Uh, why Okinawa? So if you can please explain that. Well, I, first, I think um, historically, and probably all of you know that uh, the late Kojiomi had this vision of uh, transforming Okinawa and building the best of the best research institute uh, as, as kind of a dual mission and use one uh, to support the other, uh, which is a brilliant idea. Uh, and Okinawa is a beautiful place and as you've seen, uh, just uh, having lunch in this beautiful uh, uh, cafeteria is, is a, a, so attractive, so beautiful, so inspiring for, for researchers. And uh, uh, the Japanese government did uh, a very courageous and, and very uh, smart move to invest in, in, in OIST in a, such a way uh, that created uh, this uh, beautiful facility. And you're going to have a tour later on in this facility and to attract that, uh, these talents that you already heard some of them and you'll hear more. Um, so this is really, um, uh, the answer is that Okinawa has a great potential. Uh, I don't think OIST could have been created elsewhere, uh, certainly not in Tokyo area, uh, because then we will be competing with others and we will be uh, kind of impacted by, by the surrounding. So I think it is a, a special experiment here. And uh, if you look at the e ecology uh, environment, so it's, it's, it's really also very interesting from the ecology side. Uh, Nature-wise, we get a lot of interest in that respect. And, um, and, and we're in the middle of, uh, of uh, uh, the o uh, Asian peninsula, uh, very close to a lot of areas. So it does make a lot of sense. Uh, it, it has its challenges, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think uh, it has a lot of uh, power. And last but not least, I want to mention the fact that we have an extremely supportive community here in Okinawa uh, that is really uh, making this uh, possible because it's extremely difficult, as you may know, uh, for non-Japanese to embed into a, a, an environment. And the Okinawan are very, very open, supportive of our activities. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Let's uh, take that a step further. So, Gilson, you were from Israel, uh, from Weizmann Institute. Uh, you were trying to grow the institute. And as a result, I believe that uh, the researchers became the center of the ecosystem in that town, and that became the hub in Israel. So if you look at Okinawa from that perspective, so starting from OIST, do you think uh, we can create a similar pattern like that here in Okinawa? Do you have that kind of image? So um, I'd, maybe I'd like to ask um, Dr. Karen as well about this question, but starting with Gilson. Yeah, um, yeah. I have this vision. I think this is the vision that we're following, uh, with collaborations with uh, national universities around in the local uh, and the national uh, stage. I think we we have to collaborate with a lot of other partners. But uh, you're right. Uh, this is uh, first creating the um, I would say uh, intellectual magnet to bring talent and uh, the power, and then to create a hub of of uh, of uh, companies, startups, uh, and entrepreneurs that work with uh, in all, all over Okinawa that are really uh, attracted to work with OIST. But I, I, I'm happy to also share the, my time with uh, President Markidis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, um, definitely that, um, that we are um, comparing and co collaborating 
naturally with all the universities that our researchers are connecting to. That's one thing. And that is a lot of um, possibilities there. But also since we are um, have a different model with the curiosity drive, there are some universities in the world that do have that as well. And, and Weizmann is one of them. Uh, ISTA in Vienna is another one. And Caltech might be one or was one. <laughs> that wasn't so nice to say. <laughs> but, uh, but they have uh, actually, I talked to them recently and they are giving us a lot of hints what we have to think about so that we don't lose our, um, uh, the way that we are running this university. And I think we have, we have a lot of interest in the community of academia in the world really to, uh, to, to be successful. And so that because this, uh, this is a strong awareness that uh, universities need to take up another role for, uh, for the challenges that the world has. And also including to know how to collaborate and build trust and, and be able to uh, s change mindset. Uh, so, I, uh, so I do think that uh, there, there are even more university uh, environments that would like to connect with us on that, not only on the, on the science, but also on the role of the universities. And uh, we see a lot of interest to, to really help to do that together. So I just, but while I have the, the word here, maybe I can say that in addition to what Gil said about the location for OIST here, I think we should not forget that actually being uh, on this southern tip of Japan, as, uh, and but also being part of Asia Pacific Island, uh, all the way from India, maybe to Hawaii and beyond. I think it's very, uh, that's an also very important, I don't know if it was part of the planning, but I see now that I get a lot of interest from the Asia Pacific because of a long time history that Okinawa used to be a hub for, for trade and, uh, and, and a place where you, everybody felt welcome. And we can benefit from that today as well. And Japan can. Thank you very much. That's very clear. The background, I think, to why you all came to Okinawa is included in that. I think that's a really important perspective. So I'd like to hear a little bit from Mashida-san, and also we can hear a little bit more from our local Motonaga-san. And Mashida-san, you've worked in a lot of countries. So what are your thoughts about Okinawa? Thank you very much. So I think really thinking about the startup ecosystem, can that be created here in Okinawa or how do we connect from that ecosystem is what I want to talk about. So if I could take a few minutes, that would be okay. Yes, that's okay by me. Thank you. I'll try and be as quick as possible. So to create a startup ecosystem, what's really important is talent, money, market, and also the regulatory environment. Now, there are other things, of course, but I think those are the critical areas. So thinking about the talent perspective and thinking about Singapore, there's this general image that Singapore has lots of startups, but they're almost all non-native startups. So there's not a lot of Singaporeans who do a lot of startup activity. It's all foreigners to Singapore. But, for example, thinking about the taxation system, being able to do everything in English, having a great education system, are means to attracting talents to Singapore. So this is something that Singapore government has changed its policy on. It improved its education system. It's trying to encourage Singaporeans to become more entrepreneurial but that also is the question of how you can bring more people in from outside. So the question is how far can Okinawa make a success of that aspect? That's one key thing. So from that perspective, it was talked about earlier, just putting money to one side. Having lots of different attractive aspects is great, but if you're thinking about being here in the long term, the question of what do you do with family, what do you do with education, what do you do about your day-to-day -day lives becomes a question, actually. So right now, there's only a university here, there's no elementary school, there's no junior high school. So you come here and you want to research, but where do you send your kids to for school? So perhaps an international school, having that established here, that's something that should be seriously considered. In order to really truly formulate an ecosystem is one thought that I've had. And also, you're in Okinawa. So this should be something for the government to look at. but. Looking at taxation, looking at tax means, I think it's very tough. Um, there's not a great deal that could possibly be done, but if something could be done, this could be a real financial hub, actually, if something could be changed or it could become a real startup ecosystem. I do believe that strongly. And going back to that money aspect, right now, 
Startups are attracting a lot of money compared to 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I think it's changed. It's still said that it's lower than the US, but the market's smaller than the US, so in a sense that's kind of obvious. But from a Japanese corporation perspective, I think there's a sense that a lot of money is being attracted to startups. The world generally is shifting toward a wealthier level, but I think Japan is in a really great stage warming up toward that, and I think there's still room and purse strings at businesses to be able to do that kind kind of spending. So to be able to put that money in startups is really important. And just on the market that I mentioned, I think this is possibly the trickiest thing. Looking at large global business, should that be what you aim for? Becoming a massive unicorn, if you want to do that, there are certain things you have to think about. But talent is the key to that. To start a business here in Japan, then that talent trap is something that you can fall into. Very unfortunately, the good news is that Japan is a big market. The bad news is that it's big enough. There's not a lot of merit to go outside of Japan. If, for example, you have a few tens of billions, maybe you can create a company of that size. And rather than doing it outside, it's probably better to do it here domestically in Japan. There's greater efficiencies doing it here in, in domestically. But if you want to try and gather global talent here in Japan, as we were talking earlier, when you look at the world of startups, there's money challenges, there's a variety of different hurdles that have to be overcome in order to be able to attract the necessary talent. And frankly speaking, and I'd be interested in my other panelists' opinions, when you think about OIST, what about creating an OIST sub-campus in America? And if you have a sub-campus in America, that creates a place where you can begin companies. You have seeds here at OIST, then you have Japanese capital that can start up in the U.S. and you get funding in the U.S. That might be an interesting model to pursue. That might be global deep tech, an opportunity to spread that. Is that a direction that would be interesting to pursue? is something I've thought about. And also, Douyukai, Keisai Douyukai right now is looking at increasing its membership of startups. And you have once per year a round table, the Keisai Douyukai, where you have large corporations, their executives and startup executives having an opportunity to connect. They often don't have a moment to interact and interface, and they often speak different languages. But creating those connections, Keisai Douyukai becoming that platform is something that we're starting to see. And that, I think, within the Japan context could be quite useful. And finally, on the regulatory context, I'm also on the committee for that. But Japan is the department store of regulations. We have them all over the place. For example, Okinawa, we have to use the positioning of Okinawa. It's really important in national policy. I think there's lots of ways to be able to leverage that position. Testbed is something that's been talked about today. But when you think about testbed, there are probably ways to further change or experiment with the regulations and rules that we have. I think that would be a great area for activity. For example, in Singapore, the government is quite flexible and there's lots of things that move and change with the government. But in Japan, thinking about Okinawa, if Okinawa Prefecture can work harder with OIST, I think there's a lot of potential there. So I'd be interested in hearing more about that direction too. Thank you. I did take a, quite a lot of time. But no, thank you very much. So to be able to try and develop, looking from a startup business perspective, market, people, money, they might come together. But regulations, if you can't do it here, you go somewhere else or you match it somewhere else. So thinking about that very broad approach to be able to create an ecosystem based here, I guess that's what we're talking about. So there's quite a few questions there. Gil, did you want to take any of those or Motonaga-san? Yes, if I may, first of all. So, first of all, uh, Mashita-san mentioned why was, sorry, the only question I had to why OIST was established here in Okinawa. I wanted to add a little bit more to that. The reason that OIST was established here in Okinawa is that Okinawa, it was part of our promotion strategies here. When you think about Okinawa and trying to support Okinawa, there's tourism and other ways of supporting Okinawa. They're kind of obvious ways of doing it. But when you look at it from a different perspective, a different position, Okinawa doesn't have a lot of manufacturing industry. So from starting from an academic position, looking at those very advanced and latest engineering to find a way for that to take roots was something that would be felt to be good. And we wanted to have a world top class graduate school university. We should create that here in Okinawa. That was what was talked about. And we wanted to realize that. And because of that, OIST was established, is my understanding. And 
We wanted to make that robust, and there was a big question about who was going to be president. That was a big topic back in the day, so we see Sidney Brenner. Mr. Sidney Brenner, a Nobel Prize winner, was invited to become president, and President Brenner created the meaning and the purpose of OIST. And Masha-san mentioned a moment ago about that long-term view. Families, from the very earliest days, that's been a challenge that OIST has faced, because we want families to be able to come to Okinawa, to be a livable place for the entire family. And there was initially AMIX, an international school which was established, and local businesses provided a lot of support for that as well. And now, here, the faculty that are working here, there are children there that go to that school, and local Okinawans also also go to that school. So that's also a forum for exchange and connection. And also, when you think about OIST, when you look at the research results that come out of OIST, that leads to economic development of Okinawa. That was another big theme for establishing OIST here. So to be able to create that growth and development, whether it's startups as we've been talking about, that developing is the ideal picture that I think we could pursue. So I think that from our perspective, OIST-centered industrial cluster, for example, has that been established? We haven't reached that yet, and we would very much like to see us reaching that stage so that that can then connect to the promotion of Okinawa. Thank you very much for that, uh, starting from the foundation of um, OIST and uh, creating cluster or ecosystem uh, here. We still need to go through um, future paths, and there are still some uh, challenges. Master san um, you talked about the subcampus in the United States and working with that uh, subcampus outside of Japan, uh, connecting to the world to improve the value of uh, OIST. Uh, any comments on that proposal, Gil? Um, I think we should uh, bring the United States here, not go to the United States. Um, <laughs> good answer. <laughs> uh, and, um, but uh, I, it's a challenging uh, thought. So yeah, so it's good for as an as a exercise. Um, uh, first, I, I, I want to say that the science education is another way we can really support Okinawa, and I see us as an important player here, and serving as a role model for kids uh, to grow and to uh, to practice science, and this is uh, a long-term investment, so it takes a long time to, to get that, but uh, this is really important. And uh, uh, Mashita-san, your uh, comment on, on test beds and regulatory need and tax incentives and all that is extremely important, and infrastructure on the island, transportation, um, visa, uh, you know, foreigners' visa, um, all that is really very, very important to, uh, for the government to think through and for the local government to support to the extent that we could have a, a small-scale pilot here in Okinawa. The beauty of Okinawa is that it's small and it's not in the middle of the country. So you can do some more, I would say, progressive experiments here. And I would, this is the selling point. I would try to sell it to the government as uh, let's release some things here that could be really uh, experimental in some sense, but uh, would really show a lot of power and, and attract. You're right, to attract, we, we are very successful because we put a lot of resources and on a smaller scale we can do it, but if we want to grow the startup activity here, uh, attract more talent and retain the talent here, all the things you describe are very important, inc including developing this, uh, the school, the high school, all, all that is uh, really most important. And all of that need to be done in a way that will benefit the community around us uh, in Okinawa. So um, uh, this is an invitation from you as leaders to promote that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Motonaga-san, um, the idea of Mashita-san, uh, would you like to uh, say a few comments on that? Yes, it's a very interesting idea to have subcampus outside of Japan. But then, of course, uh, we have to start from here, uh, from OIST. And I think um, Gil already talked about this, but uh, startup companies um, from OIST, EF Polymer, I think uh, this is very interesting to me personally. 
And uh, if Polina, uh, this can work um, as a part of the contribution to the promotion of Okinawa, and I think this is going to be a very good role model from OIST. And um, research results of OIST, and this uh, organic polymer technology that spawn out of OIST, um, this can be used across the world. And I, as you have pointed out, um, in Ukraine, um, this polymer can make contribution in Ukraine. So this is a technology born out of Okinawa, and talking about the market, uh, it can be used in Asia or overseas, and there is a huge market out there. Therefore, uh, we should be able to let know of such technology, and it's very important to nurture our startup companies here so that uh, they can become bigger, including EF Polima. And uh, there are collaborative initiatives there uh, with uh, us, Okinawa Electric Power as well, and those initiatives can be globalized going forward. Thank you very much. So, Masuda-san, what you are talking about is, yes, it's it's about the size. So, in terms of valuation, trillion um, scale, uh, if we want to become such a big um, university, so if uh, we are limited uh, in Japan, Japan, you can't expect global investment, and it's very difficult to change that. Therefore, in order to become global, like in the area of deep depth, for instance, it's not as if we go to the U.S. and we disappear in here. But then it's like a startup system as a basis of the startup, but we will deploy the global operation there in the United States. However, the research core stays here in Okinawa. And uh, the cost of research is cheaper in Japan, so we should benefit from that. So I think uh, we need to um, have a separate thinking that way. So if uh, we would like to create big businesses and the central government would like to promote that, but then if you think about uh, Japan and only think about Japan, we can't really go global. So I think we need to um, have a separate idea. Uh, from being here in Okinawa. So, of course, uh, being here in Okinawa is also important. So, yes, so, um, yes, if we would like to uh, become bigger uh, in scale, and we can use the budget of OIST. Yes, in terms of the capital also, we use the capital from Japanese companies. So, this is Japan capital. But where are we going to be registered? It doesn't have to be simply limited to Okinawa. Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> I, I also agree with that, by the way. I also think that we should, uh, and OIST is doing that, uh, think global always. So uh, taking your idea, uh, keeping the campus here, but uh, reaching out to globally to uh, uh, not just, by the way, US, but uh, Europe is important, Asia is important. So we globally reaching out, actively doing that academically and from the uh, business side, I think this is very, very good and, uh, and, and really this is our strategy. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree with that. So listening to what's been discussed, I think um, as an initiative, that's very important. And in terms of uh, nurturing human resources, developing talents, including locals in Okinawa, I think uh, we need to have ex international exchange as an opportunity, and this can lead to a variety of innovation. Therefore, uh, to have a kind of a startup hub uh, in the United States, if we can network there, then, of course, so we can expect um, a more um, like broadened uh, horizon. So I all agree with that. Yes, I think uh, it's been a great discussion. Thank you very much for that. So let's uh, uh, change gears to address different topics. So OIST uh, is really wonderful. It uh, even cannot be benchmarked. And, uh, but we need to have budget, enough budget, right? And as Motonaga-san said, um, the budget is born out of the uh, promotion of Okinawa, uh, quite a, a big budget, but then it has to be sustainable, right? So for such a budget, what kind of a budgeting mechanism should be there? It's a kind of a tricky, sensitive question, but I'd like to start with Gil, followed by Motonaga-san and Mashita-san. So obviously, you, you, you very rightfully discovered describe the, um, the challenge. Uh, uh, and uh, I think OIST has been um, focusing in the last few years 
uh, on diversifying uh, fund funding resources. And we're looking into uh, both looking abroad, uh, also from the academic side, uh, attracting uh, competitive grants, and uh, also in uh, philanthropy. And we're going to strengthen that uh, in a way that will impact not only Japan, but also look in the United States and elsewhere to attract. Uh, because good science uh, and this type of activity is really unique. And I believe that we can, in the right framing, we can really uh, attract a lot of uh, investors and, and, and potential uh, donors. Uh, and in terms of the industry academia collaboration, uh, here I think there is an opportunity for the industry to, to take uh, to chip in, uh, either uh, through the fund that we created and the second fund that maybe followed that uh, as a business opportunity, but also in collaborative uh, activities or in uh, joining uh, on ground here on, on in Okinawa. Uh, as I said, uh, we are open and we want to create within the university an area which is very closely interfacing with the industry. And I think this is a great model and a good opportunity for companies to, to, to come here. And I, I, you know, in 10 years, maybe we'll have uh, uh, Hitachi, uh, Santori, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, all of them together. And I just named a few just uh, out of my head, no, no, no particular uh, discussion at the moment. But this could be uh, a great opportunity for, for companies to enjoy both worlds, really to be uh, to stay within their uh, comfort zone, but to collaborate and to be open to uh, cutting edge uh, science. Um, and beyond that, I think what we will need is uh, tap into a, a different source of funding from the government, uh, central government, not, not associated with the uh, budget for uh, Okinawa. Uh, this is really essential for its existence. And uh, there are you, you're better educated than me to say which are the sources available, uh, but and we will have to hear your advice on that. And uh, we should build the power uh, to impact the decision makers to do that and to build this, because OIST has to be uh, to grow and OIST has to be successful, to continue to be successful for Okinawa and for Japan. I, 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 uh, and I'd be happy to join any one of you anywhere to, to preach for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we have members from the Budoyukai. I think that's well, a member. Uh, uh, excuse me, that was a message to the business leaders, and I believe that's another um, thing that we uh, at the committee should think about. Well, right now, um, the government money is being used, and um, OISTE is achieving a lot of things. And of course, uh, you may get private money that may be turned into an endowment. And right now, globally, um, especially U.S. universities, uh, could be a model that OIST might want to follow. So for a while, the Okinawa promotion budget will be utilized but as you just said, um, adding more funding so that they can turn into endowments. I believe that's the scheme that should be followed. Of course, uh, investment into startups and IPO of the startups, you might get some gains, and that also could be added to that endowment fund. And, and one thing that is related right now, the government is trying to create a, a global startup campus in Tokyo, in Ebisu, um, where the defense um, agency uh, used to uh, stand um, about five, 50, trill, 50 billion yen, 50, 60 billion yen is going to be invested. And, and of course, it also has to be self-reliant in the future. I believe OIST can be a model for that. Thank you very much. Motonaga-san, please, um, after hearing the opinions. Well, yes, um, OIST, maintaining its current functions, um, yes, the Okinawa Promotion Fund or other government funding will be necessary going forward. That's what I think. 
Because basic research and innovative science, when you want to pursue that, um, the private sector's power alone is not going to uh, lead to social implementation. It may be very difficult at the outset. So once, until that is established, I believe you need to have a systematic um, support from the central government. But then after um, you have the foundation established, then you might switch to gathering more funding from the private sector. And of course, companies that grew out of OIST will also be effective in this. The government, I think, is just rushing to gain a lot of results and achievements. So maybe we should have a, a little longer term perspective and OIST as well as local Okinawan companies, as well as um, other companies from around Japan should support the effort. Well, thank you very much. Well, yes, because of the OIS nature, um, yes, for a while government funding is necessary, but then after that you might shift a little bit towards private funding. And of course you have to have a idea about uh, the timing and time scale. Uh, just to, you know, uh, give it a, a vision of, of a, a potential future, uh, and again relating back to the example of the Weizmann Institute, which has the very similar uh, characteristics of OIST. Uh, Weizmann uh, has 270 principal investigators, so this is the size, has been operating over 70 years, and was able, after 50 years, to create an endowment through the, uh, this all activities, in, but mainly commercial success from commercialization, uh, which is bigger in compared to size than Harvard. I mean, compared uh, normalized to size. Uh, and this is really sustainable. So 75% of the Weizmann budget comes from uh, the endowment plus competitive ground. So government is only supporting 25. I cannot promise OIS to reach that, OK? This is not a promise. This is not. But I do want to mention this as a role model, as a role model, as a model that can really work. And it's, it's uh, based on fundamental research. Uh, in a smart way, so uh, which OIST is really following. No. So we, I'm again. I started. I said I'm optimistic. That's why I'm optimistic. Well, thank you very much for that. So, well, ten trillion funds, and um, there's a lot of examples. But basic research, a social implementation, the balance between the two. Um, that's also a part of the homework, I believe, that we have to look at. And now I am aware of the time. I think I'm. Uh, supposed to wrap up here. So starting from Motonaga-san, um, if I can ask each and every one of you to um, talk to, uh, uh, give a message uh, to the Toyukai people here, uh, your wish list about what uh, we should see, what are the things that should change organizationally, or what is it that you expect more? So if I can go around, um, starting from Motonaga-san. I think um, the first speaker has the toughest job. Well, expectations, well, as we've heard in the discussion, um, OIST, um, the industry academia collaboration should be closer. I think that's what we've heard. And so we should have more opportunities like this. And as um, was mentioned earlier, OIST also should appeal to companies about what uh, research themes you are taking up and what is happening at OIST, because the companies also might be able to match uh, their issues with what OIST has. And that would lead to industry academia collaboration, which would lead to resolving issues out there in society. I believe that's what we need going forward. Thank you. And thank you for um, bravely taking up the first speaker's job. So, Gilsan, please. Yeah, I, I've been asking so many things during the session, so I, 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 would, I would like to thank you for, for a lot of the things you've already done and uh, the fact that you're here. Uh, so uh, we touched upon many things, uh, and uh, all of them are very important. I think uh, the, the top goal would be uh, to have this uh, additional funding source. And second goal would be 
to find ways to collaborate closely uh, with uh, with uh, with all of you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, there are three things, as I said earlier. Um, so utilizing the uh, special uh, zone uh, strategy of the government, uh, maybe you, you should find what's unique to Okinawa and, and focus on that. Um, regulations don't change easily. But things are starting to change bit by bit because of um, the needs, um, ride share, which, thought, which was thought to be impossible in Japan. That's also changing here in Japan. So um, I think Okinawa should raise its voice and um, seek these changes. And also the sub-incubation center in the U.S., uh, which I proposed, uh, maybe uh, it's a Japanese capital-funded uh, thing, but it's global. If OIST can lead the way, uh, money will be returned to Japan, and that money could be utilized to create the next industry. So I'm hoping that we can create a cycle like that. And lastly, the most important one is to have these uh, connections with a major company, so a collaboration with Keizai Doyukai um, to make new things, and the Doyukai people also. We hope that uh, member companies here can buy these startups and buy uh, with a high price. Uh, so if you can acquire a company that is, has been launched from OIST, it would be best. Well, thank you very much. And I think I'm one minute over my allocated time. I'm very sorry for the poor time management, but thank you very much for your cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, um, I have asked um, Namsan to uh, keep the time, but thank you very much for the wonderful moderation. Um, and also talking about the funding part as well. Thank you very much. And once again, I'd like to ask the audience to give a big round of applause to all four. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we want to close up. We would like to begin, first of all, with President Karen Markides and Mr. Takeshi Ninami, Representative Director. Three hours has flown by so quickly, but I would like to ask for just some final closing remarks from those two. First, I'd like to invite President Markides. The floor is yours. Okay, yeah, please. Thank you so much for this inspiration. Uh, I think we all feel it and uh, we uh, uh, definitely are ready, uh, all of us, to take a next step. Uh, we, we heard so many interesting things here that uh, we, we can move on and I, I am so uh, pleased uh, that uh, all these things that were said and that all of you are here and, uh, and we are all, uh, I guess, in agreement about this. To meet closer with the corporations and both here now that we have the organization here from Okinawa and also from Japan, this makes it extra special. And, uh, and we are, of course, uh, as uh, I also mentioned, as a university, we are in the space of, uh, of both the local, the national and the international international and we should utilize that because definitely companies are also in the global space and we should really make sure that we take advantage of this uh, that we we can actually bring to our local settings and not to our nas national needs so um, when we meet closer i also heard a lot which, which i like very much that we should meet in the pre-competitive space because if we do so we can actually be the ones that set the new standards the new uh, competitiveness uh, in the world and we uh, if we include also our phd students in this we will make them into change makers to leaders that can actually really take this uh, uh, this new adventures uh, to to really prosperous solutions i also think that uh, one thing when we collaborate closer to um, something that worked very well in, in Sweden was that we have, we get spin out, spin in uh, possibilities because there are many uh, things I know in your companies that you doesn't really fit 
to move on. But if we build trust and we build collaboration and we you you give you put these um, ideas into Gil's hands and we uh, work together and you can actually spin in after if you have interest. So so that could be a very uh, good motor in innovation as well. Uh, I also think that about this uh, uh, to have. Um, to have some activities outside of uh, of Japan, yes, uh, uh, I uh, my approach uh, uh, is really that I feel that uh, mirror labs or or collaborations that are also mob including mobility uh, is the best way because uh, in the, by the end of the day we want to build trust also in the places where we are uh, collaborating in other parts of the world and we have to to also recognize that there are public private university partnerships there as it is here and if we can get the trust between that then we will uh, really be able to uh, to be to to prepare and to build interest and trust for also buying the products all over the world I, I come from a country where we have to think export from day from daycare center um, Sweden is always depending on export I think I believe in that I believe that we have to find solutions that would work in the whole world so I think this is uh, uh, also for a big country that, like Japan, I think it's a winning concept. Um, so building trust is something that came f several times here. And of course, this is uh, uh, something that we really need to, uh, it sounds easy, but it, it, it has some, uh, takes some skills and it takes some time and, and thinking proactive. And I, I'm very much interested to work more on that. One other thing that to think about the whole families, the whole we, um, that we have here, and it, it is tr uh, actually true. Even though there are some schools and some high schools around, uh, we are uh, one of our highest risks here at Oist is if we cannot get an IB high school uh, in uh, on the island that is in close enough to us that we could work on because we know we have made some. Uh, um, the surveys and we know that we will have some problems coming up if we don't get that because we, we will lose a lot of our really st uh, strong people when their children are growing up to that age. So please if we could think about because of course there are more uh, business, if more business brings in here and, and not the least in the tourist uh, area we, we need to have also these type of skills built up so uh, I, I'm sure that to, if we think together, we can get enough uh, uh, critical mass of young people to really build some high school of that level. So um, uh, there was, oh yeah, the, the money, of course, and uh, the budget, that was also good that you touch upon, because that is uh, something that uh, I agree with everything said. And, uh, and of course, I want to push a little bit more for these uh, solutions that are actually successful in United States universities. The BLT model, build, lease, uh, transfer model that we could do together and uh, every, we could be winners uh, on both sides and we could move fast. And I think some of these ideas that we have and some of this research that were presented here today could actually move fast. So, um, so please uh, work with us on that. And, um, and I think also when we are um, working together, we should make sure that we make it visible on uh, both locally, uh, nationally and internationally. Thank you so very much. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so inspired. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So lastly but not least, uh, Mr. Ninami, please. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering what I should talk. Um, first and foremost, uh, we have to set up uh, an ecosystem here in OIST to bring uh, more resources, including not only the uh, funding, but also talented people from the world. It's been uh, a great success, but uh, we need more. And uh, as uh, current talked about, we need uh, the infrastructure, like uh, school, like uh, lots of things to attract the uh, talent from the world. My son talked about the Silicon Valley, but uh, we need to challenge the uh, competition in the world. But uh, the key thing is how to retain, how to recruit 
good talent from the world. To expedite the, uh, lots of uh, research is quantum uh, and uh, supplement. And uh, I, I think uh, we found uh, the uh, sharing uh, future that is uh, we can live more than 100 years uh, with the, uh, uh, the uh, kicking alive, which means not because of Suntory, but, but uh, Oyster's effort. And uh, I would like to uh, solicit uh, more funding to the, the research so that uh, we can live uh, you know, healthy for 200 years. <laughs> so um, I think uh, I'm not talking about uh, kind of wishes, and uh, um, I'm not talking about just the desire. That will be coming soon. It's uh, real. So, and uh, how to make that happen, it's up to us. So today, we learned uh, a tip of the iceberg of the uh, research is being done here and uh, how we can uh, expedite, how we can make things uh, you know, happen for the sake of the uh, better society. So better society means better Okinawa, better Japan, after all, better the world. So um, today, we gathered here sharing the uh, vision and uh, will to support uh, OIST and uh, working together with the uh, Okinawa Kizado Yukai. Again, thank you so much for your attendance uh, of the uh, current uh, Gale and uh, a big support from uh, Okinawa Kizado Yukai. And uh, I want to propose that uh, we'll have the, uh, this event to convene here, perhaps annually. And uh, we should have the uh, um, lively um, panel, which happened just uh, led by the uh, Nambu-san, who is uh, the uh, vice chairman of uh, 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 Sumitomo uh, Corporation. Uh, will be, hopefully. And uh, so <laughs> I think uh, we will have the, uh, this kind of uh, engage so that we can get to know each other. Kerry mentioned trust wideness. Trust is before funding, but the fund is needed. <laughs> so let's work together. And uh, um, I think we can make that happen. Uh, so uh, maybe next year here, we'll have the uh, more interesting uh, findings from the researchers of OIST. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Minami. I think this is the first step, the very start. And you mentioned about next year, but we do hope that we can see you again next year like this. And thank you very much for setting up the stage like this um, to all the people at OIST and also the Okinawa Keizaido Yukai uh, for your support. We are very happy to see you. And with this, uh, we would like to end this symposium. And thank you very much for the three hours. Thank you.